everyone. It's Tuesday, September 21st, 2021, and I'm calling tonight's Columbus, Wisconsin City Council meeting to order. City Clerk Pat Gable will now take the roll. All right. Here. Arnold. Here. Gray. Present. Moda. Present. Piperone. Here. Reed. Here. All present. Great. If you are able, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight's meeting has been noticed in accordance with state statutes and local ordinances. So I'm now looking for a motion to approve tonight's agenda. I will make a motion to approve tonight's agenda. Motor right. will second. Sorry. So it has been moved and seconded that we approve tonight's agenda. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, moving on to correspondence and communications. We do have a number of people who have signed up to speak tonight. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, great. Um, because we have eight people, we, are, uh, we wanna give everybody an opportunity to speak. So we're asking that you limit yourselves to no more than uh, three minutes each and uh, that you uh, speak about either past or present agenda items. And this is an opportunity for council members to listen to citizens, but it's not uh, a time for dialogue. Um, so there won't be any back and forth conversation. This is just kind of our chance to hear from you. Um, and based on my five months as mayor, I know that it is unnecessary for me to remind speakers to be polite and respectful because everyone always has in the past. So um, when you get up to speak, would you please identify yourself, your name and your address and Joe Hammer, you get to go first. Oh, and then we've, we have, a, because we have so many people, we have a little thing just to let you know, Joe, how you're doing time-wise. Okay, we're, there we there go. There you go. All right. Okay, my name is Joe Hammer. I live at 162 East School Street and am, am, and am employed by Columbus Water and Light. I'm here speaking out tonight against resolution number 1821, which Common Council adopted two weeks ago in an illegal and unethical manner. I refer you to Columbus, Wisconsin Code of Ordinances, Chapter 2, Article 2, Section 241. All matters, including without limitation, ordinances, resolutions, and reports shall be submitted to the Committee of the Whole for review and comment before being placed on the Common Council agenda. Also, the fact that nobody from city department heads, the Water and Light Commission, or any other board was cons consulted or asked for opinion on this matter. The audacity that any governing body believes it has the right to dictate pumping poison into a person's body or stick a swab with a known carcinogen up your nasal, nasal passage is incomprehensible. The attempt violates the U.S. Constitution, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and the Nuremberg Code of uh, 1947. Pfizer did not follow their protocol. FDA did not follow their protocol for allowing this, as you call, vaccine to be used. Therefore, the injections are experimental, according to Pfizer and the FDA's protocol uh, codes that they follow. The Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System data released 9-10 of 2021 by the CDC showed a total of 675, 900, or 593 reports of adverse events from all ages, uh, age groups following COVID shot injections, including 14,506 deaths, 8,171 uh, 8, serious illnesses between December 14th of 2020 
and September 3rd, 2021. This resolution that you adopted is insane and it is unethical and it is immoral and it needs, you as a council need to lift it. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, John Salswadel. Is this thing on? Hello. Yes. Okay. Good evening. Um, my name is John Salswadel. I live at 841 Park Avenue, and I've been a volunteer with Historic Preservation in Columbus for about two decades. I was first interested in the rich history of Columbus and joined the Columbus Auditorium Corporation and then uh, the Columbus Historic Landmarks and Preservation Commission. I'm really proud of all the work that we as a commission have accomplished here in our community. I have resigned my position as chair of and from CHLPC in ardent opposition to hearing council liaison report reflecting council emergency 18-21. I feel that the council has exercised gross overreach to mandate what I consider to be a very personal health choice in order to participate in volunteerism or employment within the city. I believe that people, people should be in charge of their own individual health choices. I'm not anti-vax or pro-vax. I'm an advocate of liberty, liberty that we all as Americans are afforded. We're born in this country with certain unalienable rights, among them freedom of choice. I feel that this is a violation, a violation of human rights, your right to privacy, as well as an infringement on our Fourth Amendment rights. It opposes the informed consent ethic found in the Nuremberg Code. You as a council are elected as representatives of your constituents. How many of you had the time to take to discuss this emergency order prior to voting on it in a unanimous vote? I find this to be a dereliction of duty and the haste in which it was presented to the council and subsequently voted on both authoritative and tyrannical. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, the next uh, speaker is Joe Alschwager. Good evening, Council. My name is Joe Alschwager. I reside at 101 Brookside Lane in Parkview Edition. I've been there for 46 years. I'm probably one of the oldest uh, residents out there. And I've seen the water come up and down many a time in some pretty tragic issues. And yeah, you folks have been kicking this can down the street now for 13 or 14 years, and we seem to be getting nowhere. Uh, there's a couple of questions I have uh, pertaining to it. One is uh, the cost of the removal of the pipe by the deer pen. What was the actual cost of that? Can anybody tell me? I believe it was something like 85000 Am I correct? Yeah, I think that was in the ballpark. Yeah. Okay, well. Yeah. And... Uh, what was the purpose for that? I mean, what, what, why did that one have to get removed and not the one that's actually holding the water back and flooding the residents? So, Joe, you know, when, when we have the public speaking part, it's an opportunity for us to hear your opinions, but we really cannot get into a back and forth, especially for something that's not on tonight's agenda. I know we've talked about this before at council meetings, so we're happy to hear your opinion. All right. I'll tell you some more information. I won't ask for any. But and, and you can feel free to contact, you know, the city administrator yeah. outside of the meeting. Yeah. All right. Uh, 
I just want to make a few comments in particular to, to this project that's been booted down the line. When they did remove the little bridge out there behind the high school at the, by the golf course where, where the creek leaves the golf course and enters the park, that bridge is removed. There is another $25,000 spent on an unnecessary project there because it did nothing. It, it did not hold the water back. The culvert was the issue, and they still haven't dealt with that. And the cost of upgrading the survey, I know uh, it was pretty uh, extensive just to find out we're in the same place we were 13 years ago. Uh, something's got to be done. I mean, this is just the, the same type of reaction we got out of the council when I worked for the city back in the 70s. I was a licensed wastewater treatment operator. I ran a wastewater plant in the city. This plant was totally overwhelmed. It was over 25, 30 years old. It was biologically overloaded, hydraulically overloaded, it was not meeting the standards. The reports go into EPA and DNR, and it's not a funny issue. You don't just mess with it. I brought that up to the council. I said, somebody's got to get going and get us on the grant list. It's, this plant has to be upgraded or replaced. And they told me to no, just change the figures on the report. I said, look at the fine print. That's a $10,000 fine and two years in prison. This is no rinky-dink report. This goes all the way to EPA and everybody. And they can monitor you anytime they want without your knowing. They'll monitor your outfall. And they know if you're illegally discharging. You know, so Joe, we... It took I, I just want to let you know we are. This is on the agenda for the committee of the whole tonight, yeah. and uh, so it is something that we are going to be discussing. Okay. Um, so I, I'm I just trying to enlighten you on a few past right. facts to show you the inactivity of this council. You're more concerned with the uh, pandemic and the viruses and stuff than you are your your flooding of your citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Michelle Stark. Michelle Stark, Columbus, Wisconsin. Those who trust in the Lord are like, like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people both now and forevermore. The scepter of the wicked will not remain over the land allotted to the righteous. For then the righteous might use their hands to do evil. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, to those who are upright in heart. But those who turn to crooked ways, the Lord will banish with the evildoers. Psalm 125. This board has failed in upholding the law. For what? Fear. They went, want our children in their power, not us, the parents. The time for action is now. Teach your kids about Rosa Parks. Teach your children it's okay to stand up to tyrants. Give your children permission to refuse to comply with their masks or use religious freedom. You can fill out a note and send it to school air kids and demask them. And if they stand up against you, you can take them to court. Let their teachers know it's okay not to enforce this abuse of power. Ignore the dictator, Annette Duman. God gave you these children to raise. God did not give that authority to the likes of Annette Duman or this board. With saying that, remember the rights God gave you and be fierce in protecting your children. Be like Rosa Parks. Fight back with noncompliance. God bless you and remember, God already won. We just have to listen and open the door. And if that can't work, request school choice vouchers because... They don't want to comply. They want your kids to stay home. Get school choice vouchers and get your kids in a different school that will meet the requirements of getting your kids the right education. Because this is tyrants. This is ungodly. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Michelle. Um, <laughs> Dave Keening. Did I pronounce that right? Hi, I'm Dave Kane. I work for Columbus Water and Light. Um, I am speaking on behalf of Mike McCabe. He lives at 131B South Ludington Street. Um, it says, good evening. I would like to express my concerns to you on the recent unanimous vote on the emergency order. It seems non-transparent, rushed, and heavy-handed to only give the council a few minutes to read the order and come to an opinion and decision within a few short minutes to have the, the rushed vote onto it. Currently, there is a lot of division in the country and in the state of Wisconsin. I feel this order now brings the division much closer to home and to our city. Our employees and our community pitting employee against employee, 
neighbor against neighbor, and in some cases, family against family, which I find sad and disappointing, and as a citizen of the city of Columbus, in my opinion, this emergency order was not necessary. The city of Columbus should not be interested in itself into the personal medical decision of its employees nor its citizens. My hope as a, as a former older person and as a citizen of Columbus, Wisconsin, is the mayor, city council, and city administrator are more transparent in the future and the council is given adequate time and research to talk with their constitutes on these items before making such serious decisions. Thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs> Gerald Lenz. No? Okay. <laughs> Ron Curtis. I am speaking on the topic on the Committee of the Whole. Okay. Wait. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, Lee Trask, did you want to speak to something on this? Okay. Uh, Lee Trask, 346 North Ludington Street. Um, at the last meeting, the council president asked people to set aside personal beliefs and political reasons uh, when considering resolution 18-21, but it appears no time was given for the council to exercise their rational faculties to form an objective, reasoned opinion of resolution 18-21. By all appearances, the council obtained the resolution and then voted on it within a matter of minutes. There's a great deal of uncertainty and unknown uh, questions around the implications of this resolution. What are the thresholds for rescinding the resolution? What are the guard, <clears throat> excuse me? What are the guardrails on the mayoral powers in this emergency order? Uh, in this matter, the resolution states the mayor is authorized to make additional emergency order. Um, no, nothing is stated about what kind of order. Um, this entails. Um, why are certain non-employee groups added to the list of impacted individuals? Finally, how did this get forced through in the manner it did? There appears to be no mechanism in Article 7 to circumvent the requirements of Article 2 of the Columbus Code, the article governing the process for passing a resolution. I ask this council to use the proper procedure to give yourself time to think and the community a chance to give input. And secondly, about the vaccination testing requirement, I'm not going to dispute the legality of a vaccination testing requirement, but I would ask if this is the kind of community where the government is forcing itself on other people's bodies and sticking things inside them, either up their nose or in their arm. If these people say no, there will be negative consequences. Do we want our local government to be on the front lines pushing the envelope of what government can do to other people's bodies? Um, I recently submitted my vaccination information to avoid um, negative consequences outlined in the resolution and city code. But since this pandemic's been going on roughly a year and a half, the city has never reached out and had any sort of conversation about vaccinations or why you should have them. I'm 100% for vaccinations. Um, as I said, I submitted my vaccination information, but I don't think you should be forcing that on other people. Uh, set aside, so I asked this uh, body to set aside personal beliefs and their political reasons. Reach out to people who disagree with you, have a conversation, and try to understand their perspective. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Lee. <laughs> and Jack Sanderson? Okay, you're up. Thank you. Jack Sanderson, uh, 113 Dawn Court. Um, I'm not very well prepared, but I do have one cogent, relevant message about the mask requirement. I spend a lot of time reading about COVID on the Internet. Um, there's one doctor I'd like to quote. His name is uh, Dr. Michael Yaden. He's the former vice president of um, Pfizer Pharmaceutical. He was the chief research scientist for Pfizer Pharmaceutical for like 10 years or so in the early part of this century. And um, he's a lot, there's a lot of, he has a lot of material on the internet. He's out very vocal against masks, against vaccines, and against what's happening. And the one point that he made, and other people are backing him up, is the fact that 
uh, he very strongly states that uh, asymptomatic people do not transmit the virus. I'll say that again. If you're not sick, you're not spreading any virus. If you're sick, you probably have a heavier viral load. You may be more contagious. If you're sick, I'm going to bet there's nobody here tonight that's sick. If you're asymptomatic, you're not spreading the virus. There's no reason for a mask if you're not spreading the virus. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on to the consent agenda. Uh, I am looking for a motion to approve um, the consent agenda. I have a small correction. Oh, I'm, go ahead. <laughs> On the uh, council minutes, on under new business number one, the way it reads is that we're requiring the city buildings to wear masks. Uh, I'd like to adjust that sentence so it says masks are recorded to be worn in city buildings. Oh, I see which, okay. All right. And then I'd be happy to make a motion to pass the consent agenda with that change. I will second that with the correction noted. So it has been moved and seconded that uh, the consent agenda be approved with the noted uh, edit. Uh, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, um, now we're going to move on to new business. And the first item on the agenda tonight under new business is to consider and take action on resolution 1921-21, a resolution approving an amendment to the project plan and boundaries of tax incremental district number five in the city of Columbus. And I believe Matt is here to talk with us about that. I'm just going to kick it off, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Joe from Ellers, who's okay. going to go through the project, briefly go through the project plan. Just one thing, since our last meeting, we did have the Joint Review Board meeting on September 15th. Also on the 15th, we had Plan Commission, had the public hearing. Uh, there were no comments at the public hearing in opposition of the TIF amendment. Actually, there were no comments about the TIF amendment. So uh, generally speaking, uh, the uh, Plan Commission then uh, passed a resolution recommending approval of the uh, TIF amendment. So with that, I'll kick it over to Joe to go over the uh, Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm Joe Murray from Ellers. Uh, we're proud to be the uh, city's financial advisor. Um, as that prior to the meeting, I handed out uh, an updated uh, project plan dated today. Um, in preparing for tonight's meeting, we found that there was a discrepancy in the the original plan that was dated September 2nd, and I'll, I'll talk about that quickly. But um, tonight, your action is, as the council is to take the final approval measure to uh, approve the amendment to TID number five. TID number five was created in 2019 as a mixed use TID uh, to facilitate uh, development uh, that due to lack of adequate infrastructure. Uh, this plan amendment uh, is to add territory to the district. As permitted, uh, you are allowed up to four territory amendments uh, to a district. This will be your first. It also amends the categories and locations and costs of some of your projects. The original project plan identified a million dollars of expenditures. This amendment will add an additional one and a half million to the project plan. Um, this is expect all these projects costs are expected to be financed through what we call a municipal revenue obligation, an MRO, or most people refer to it as a PAYGO relationship uh, arrangement. Uh, so that's what would be done uh, if you are to enter into any developer agreements and do an MRO or a PAYGO relationship, you'll need a developer agreement and that'll be up to the council to negotiate those on a case-by-case -case basis uh, as you move forward. This is purely a plan, this is not a budget, this is not a commitment, this is purely a plan uh, to utilize the TID funding for it. Um, a project as part of the development it is anticipated that roughly $7.1 million of additional development will be made um, 
uh, in the development uh, an incremental value, uh, which will help provide for the project costs. Uh, and it also anticipates that the revenue uh, generated uh, will uh, allow the district to close in 2039. The prior report had indicated 2036, and as I said, we found a discrepancy in our cash flow model, but it still does cash flow instead of it closing in 2036, it would be in 2039, which is uh, still a year earlier than the maximum term. The important findings of the resolution that you'll need to be acting on uh, this evening are uh, basically 11-fold. The first is that but for the creation of the district, the development um, uh, as identified in the plan would not occur or would not occur in a manner at the values or within the time frame of the city's um, expectation. Uh, you're basically saying that absence the, absent the use of the tax incremental financing, that you'd be unable to fully fund the program of infrastructure improvements that are identified in the plan. Second, that the economic development benefits of the district as measured by increased employment, business and personal income and property values are sufficient to comp, uh, cover the cost of the improvements. And I can get into the cash flow, and as I said, we do show this cash flowing and being able to close in 2039. Benefits, number three, benefits of the proposals outweigh the anticipated tax increments to be paid uh, by the owners of the property uh, to the overlying taxing districts. Basically, it falls back to the but for if you didn't have the create the tax incremental district, this development wouldn't occur. Therefore, there wouldn't be any additional revenue to those overlying taxing districts. Four, that not less than 50% of the area of the real, uh, within the district as amended is suitable for mixed use development, uh, which it is. You have a combination of commercial and industrial, uh, as well as several undeveloped parcels at this point. Uh, based on this, it will allow for the district to remain as a mixed-use district, which it was originally created for. Number six, project costs relate directly to promoting mixed-use development in the district are consistent with the purpose for which the district was created. And as I said, uh, you created this to provide for infrastructure improvements. Seven, improvements to be made in the district are likely to be significantly enhanced, to, are likely to significantly enhance the value of all the other real property in the district. As you improve the infrastructure, it allows for further development, which allows for property values within the district, as well as the city as a whole to improve. Eight, equalized value of the taxable property within the district falls within the 12% uh, limitation. You can't have more than 12% of your equalized value contained in a uh, in TID districts. Uh, there's a calculation in the plan that shows that you fall well underneath that, and I can get into details if you would like. Nine, the plan for the district is feasible and complies with uh, the city's master plan, which it does. Ten, uh, it's estimated that less than 35% of the territory in the district will be allocated to uh, retail business. That's a little quirk that the, it's, can't really find that in the statute, but that's a quirk that the DOR asks in every project plan that we do to, to identify. Um, and lastly, that none of the parcels to be included in the district were annexed within the preceding three years. Um, I can get go through more of the detail of the plan. I think the most important one I would like to just highlight quickly if I could, if you would turn to page 28, that's the cash flow. It's towards the back. Here's, as I said, on the left column, that's the projected increments. That's based on your current tax rates. As tax rates fluctuate up and down, values in the district fluctuate up and down, those numbers uh, will change, but we have just uh, taken a snapshot. Um, we are trying to be very conservative and not provide for inflationary factors. Uh, as you know, values can go up and down, tax rates can go up and down. We try to just hold it status quo to try to be as conservative as possible. Um, as you go over to the right, over on the right-hand side, that shows the expenditures in the green columns and the annual and the cumul cumulative balances uh, are in the gold columns off on the right-hand side. If you go all the way down to the gold box at the bottom, you'll see that in 2039, the incentive outs incentives outstanding in 2039 are $73,906, and by that time we anticipate you'd have a cumulative surplus in the district of roughly $165,000. So you'll have enough money in the fund a TID fund to pay those uh, expenditures and you could close the thing, the TID early. I do want to also just highlight, if you go to the 
last green column, you'll see the total expenditures are two million three hundred twenty thousand four ninety four. Your plan identifies the potential for two hundred fifty, uh, or I'm sorry, two point five million dollars worth of expenditures. Based on this cash flow, you were you're close. Uh, it supports two point three million. Again, this is only a snapshot. It's a plan moving forward. You'll evaluate each time, but it does show that you're close to the two and a half million dollars. And if values come in higher uh, than expected, uh, that'll provide additional revenue to undertake additional projects. And with that, if unless you'd like me to go into more detail about the plan, I'd be happy to. But I think those are the main points I would, wanted to highlight. Trina, did you have a question? Oh, no, I just have a question on the like page 23 versus page 24 for the original project plan list versus the additional project cost. Um, I see in small letters that um, project costs are not an appropriation or commitment to fund by the city. So these are both just educated guesses for how much will probably be sent, spent on street construction, street reconstruction, utility sewer. Yes, as I said, this is only a plan. It's not a budget. As those project costs can come up or down. Um, page 23 was what was included in the original plan for the million dollars when it was created back in 19. Uh, page 24 is the additional one and a half identified for um, additional incentives and development project and infrastructure projects. So the two combined is the two and a half that I was referring to. Okay, thank you. I was also confused on if it was, yeah, the one million versus one and a half, or if they were, but they're together. They're together. Oh. It should be two and a half million. I was total. getting so hopeful. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions or concerns? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. So is there any uh, further discussion on Resolution 1921? In that case, I am looking for a motion. Alder Albright can make a motion to consider uh, Resolution 19-21, Resolution Approving the Amendment to the Project Plan and Boundaries of to, to District Number 5, City of Columbus. Motiful second. So it has been moved and seconded that uh, we, um, now, now Shelly, you said to take action. Did you mean to approve? Uh, yeah, it says consider and take action on resolution 19-21. Approving an amendment. Yeah. Okay, so you, your motion, it has been moved and seconded that we okay. then approve uh, resolution 1921, approving an amendment to the project plan and boundaries of tax incremental district number five. City of Columbus, is there... And, and uh, it has been seconded by Sarah. Any further discussion? Hearing none, um, do we want to do a roll call on this or no? It's not? I don't think so. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Going on to number two um, on uh, under new business. And number two is to approve... Um, a mayoral appointment to the CDA uh, <clears throat> and um, I have uh, recommended appointing Helen Clock who is, will be the or is the new owner of what will be the tea time <laughs> wine bar on uh, East James Street <clears throat> and um, I'm also recommending that we appoint Ian Gray <clears throat> to the CDA and uh, his term would expire in April of 2022 so that he can then complete um, former Alder Mike McCabe's term. Uh, Helen Clock's term would expire in 2026. So I am looking for a motion. I have one question. Yes. Um, are, are we certain on the last name of that? I, I've known are, her by a different last what? name. Pardon me? Are we certain on her last name? Uh, I believe her last name is Clock because I know that she uh, she also has a, a, maybe a maiden name or okay. something. That, that was my question. I, I contacted her and asked her for her contact information. This is what she sent me. So, yeah. 
Okay. Alder Motif will make a motion to add Helen Clock and Ian Gray to the CDA. I will second. So it has Thanks. been moved and seconded that we uh, approve Helen Clock and Ian Gray to the CDA. All those in is there any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, moving on to number three, consider and take action on resolution 16-21, exemption, exemption from paying Columbia County library tax in uh, 2022. This is something that uh, we have, uh, we discussed last week and um, Kyle explained uh, in detail what this is all about. Um, just to refresh your memory and for those people who are here tonight, uh, the city needs to request via resolution an exemption from county library tax since the Columbus Public Library's service area lies within both Columbia and Dodge County. Uh, a resolution for each county is necessary. So <clears throat> I am looking for a motion on resolution 1621. Uh, read motions to approve resolution 16-21 for the exemption from paying the Columbia County library tax for 2022. I will second that. It has been moved and seconded that we approve the exemption from paying, paying Columbia County library tax uh, re resolution 1621 for 2022. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, the next item is to consider and take action on resolution 1721, request for exemption for the Dodge County Library tax, and it is pretty much just what I explained to you in the previous resolution, so um, I'm looking for a motion. Alder Gray moves to approve resolution 1721 for the exemption of the library tax for Dodge County. I'm looking for a second. <laughs> Alder motive for second. Yeah. Okay, it has been moved and seconded that we approve resolution 1721, request for exemption, Dodge County Library Tax. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay, item number five is to consider and take action on ordinance 757-21 an ordinance to repeal and recreate chapter 98 article 1 section 98-79 of the city code of ordinances concerning winter parking regulations and we did discuss this last week uh if uh, i know that uh, jerry's here if anyone needs uh, an update or further discussion on what it was, uh, maybe a refresher, reminder about what this was all about. But I think Jerry did good. Paul, yes. I just have one small comment um, regarding um, paragraph, uh, section 98.79, paragraph one, um, halfway down the director of public work or his designee, and the next, the next, um, um, ordinance is just or designee. So I think we should be consistent and get the his out of there per se. And that occurs twice. Can you tell me where, what you're looking at, Paul? Approximately line number eight, director of public works or his designee is hereby authorized. And what this is under section 98.79. Okay, and number, uh, I'm looking at A, B, C, and D. It's the, the after okay. the red lines. Oh, okay. I see. And that occurs um, on the second from last paragraph of paragraph one as well. Okay. So everyone found that? Okay. So I guess I'm looking for a motion with that. Well, uh, I will make a motion to approve um, Ordinance 757-21, an ordinance to repeal and recreate Chapter 98, Article 1, Section 98.79 of the City Code of Ordinances concerning winter parking regulations, with my corrections noted. And Alder Gray will second. Okay. And is everybody real clear on what the correction is? 
Okay, good. Okay, it has been moved and seconded that we um, <clears throat> approve Ordinance 757-21 um, regarding winter parking regula regulations with the edit noted by Alder Pyferone. Is there any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And now we are moving on to... Ordinance 758-21, an ordinance to repeal and uh, recreate cha uh, Chapter 86, Active 7, Section 86-26A, 86-227, and Section 86-228 of the City Code of Ordinances Concerning Snow and Ice Removal. And again, we, uh, we had a discussion about this at our last meeting. Jerry is here. If anyone has any questions regarding um, the changes in the ordinances, and um, pardon me. <laughs> so uh, okay, um, I am looking for a motion. Unless anybody has any questions for Jerry. Alder Gray moves to approve uh, Ordinance 758-21. I will second that. It has been moved and seconded that we approve Ordinance 758-21 uh, concerning the uh, snow and ice removal. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Uh, the next item on the agenda is to consider and take action on a claim for damages. And um, again, this was uh, an item that we discussed in our last meeting. Um, a claim was submitted to the city regarding a tree limb that fell um, from a tree in the tree border, broke off the tree, and uh, claims for reimbursement for were submitted to the city, and um, so we did discuss this. And I am looking for a motion. Are, Alder Motive will make a motion to deny this claim based on. Uh, the investigation that found no indication that any incident was caused by negligence on behalf of the city. Okay. Alder Albright will second that. So it has been moved and seconded that we deny this claim <clears throat> as uh, there was no negligence um, detected on the part of the city. Is there any further discussion? So uh, all those in favor? Please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The claim has been denied. Um, number Item number eight is to consider and take action on the Columbus Community Development Authority bylaws. And uh, this, again, was something. Oh, Matt, do you yeah, want to talk to I'll, us about I'll just kind of okay. give a brief. Okay. Um, so this was something CDA has talked about uh, for a couple months now. Uh, obviously, uh, it's been approved by CDA, recommended for approval, and we brought it to the last COW meeting, so we're just seeking final approval tonight. I'm here for any questions if you have any. So, so does anyone have any questions for Matt? I think Alder Moda, if you actually were involved in these bylaws, is that correct? Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> I am looking for a motion. Alder Gray moves to approve the CDA bylaws. Alder Pipe from seconds that. It has been moved and seconded that we approve the revised uh, CDA bylaws. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Is anyone opposed? Hearing none, it passes. Thank you. Um, the next. Uh, uh, Item on our agenda, number nine, is to consider and take action on 
monthly claims in the amount of $125,410.92. And so I am looking for a motion. I will make a motion to approve the payment of the claims in the amount read. Alder Moda will second. So it has been moved and, moved and seconded that we approve the uh, claims, the monthly claims provided to council. And we do take a roll call on this, so we will do that. Gray? Aye. Moda? Aye. <clears throat> Hyperone? Aye. Reed? Aye. Albright? Aye. Motion carries. Great. And now we move on to report of city officers. All right, thank you. Uh, just a few items. Uh, I've been busy the last several weeks uh, wrapping up the budget, even making changes uh, yet this afternoon as more information comes in. Uh, the uh, audit is something we've talked about in the uh, past several uh, months. We did get the draft, so uh, the uh, Joan, uh, the interim finance director, and myself have to kind of go through that and uh, make sure everything uh, looks uh, like it's in order and uh, likely also add the management uh, discussion. Uh, so that should be coming in the next uh, probably month or so. Uh, hopefully we can have uh, the auditors here to actually present that information. Uh, and then finally, uh, we uh, did conduct interviews for the treasurer last week. Uh, there were some, some good candidates that we were able to speak with. Uh, we're currently working on the background and reference information, and we hope to have a selection soon. Great. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome our new, I want to make sure I get this right, media and communications specialist. Communications okay, communications and <laughs> David Bennett, who's also recording us tonight. Welcome, David. Uh, I met David at the Tourism Commission meeting last week, and it's nice to have him here. Um, Another a reminder for everybody in Columbus that this Saturday from 2 to 6 o'clock is the Odd Oktoberfest, which is an event put on by our local Odd Fellows group on the last Saturday of every September. It takes place in Fireman's Park at the Pavilion. There will be live polka bands, ethnic food, uh, a kids area, a car show. The admission is free. There is also going to be an art and author fair in the lower level of the Pavilion with local artists and authors. And uh, coupons will be available for, I believe, for a free book or buy one, get one free uh, for the Friends of the Library's Used Bookstore, which is open now, I believe, the second and fourth Saturdays of the month. So I think they will be open that day. Um, but don't quote me on that because i got to go home and look that up. Uh, coming up uh, Sunday, October 3rd, which will happen before our next meeting, our local firefighters invite you to attend a pancake breakfast from 6.30 to noon. Uh, this year they decided to forego the traditional sit-down breakfast and turn it into a drive through due to the increase in COVID. And they will be serving pancakes, eggs, sausages, ham, and sassy cow milk. And if you go to their uh, Facebook page, um, you'll get a little more information about how it all works. It's $8 for an adult and $5 for kids. And then I'm also going to remind you that coming in November, um, we are going to be having on the Saturday after Thanksgiving a stop, shop, and sip involving local businesses. There will be a wine walk. It's a great way to support um, Columbus uh, businesses downtown. And we'll have more information on that as we get closer. And then at the Tourism Commission meeting last week, uh, we talked about how uh, the holiday train is going to be stopping in Columbus again this year. I think they had to skip last year, am I right? Um, but they will be coming back in December. It's always a big deal. It seems to get uh, to be an even bigger deal every year. It's really pretty amazing. It's very cool to have, uh, have this happen in Columbus. We don't have a date yet, and as soon as we get more information, we will pass that on to, to everybody. So thank you very much. That's all I have. And so, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Can oh I yes. Make an announcement? Did you please? Yeah. Sure. Um, it is with it is an unfortunate timing with the recent resignation of a fellow colleague on the council that I am announcing my resignation from council effective October 19th, 2021, 
due to the purchase of a new residence outside of my current district, District 2. I've had the opportunity to personally grow and learn so much about city government and was afforded the opportunity to work with some great colleagues on council as well as some great city staff. To my residents in District 2, thank you for entrusting me to serve as your councilman for the past year and a half. To my fellow council members and the mayor, thank you for all that you continue to do. Paul, we're going to miss you. I, I wish you would have found a house in, <laughs> in Mike's district. It would have just made everything, you know, pretty smooth. But, uh, yeah, and congratulations on your house. Now I can walk my Thank dog you. by there because you don't live that far from me. And uh, best wishes to you. So now I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Okay. On that note, I will make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Gray, a second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned.
All right, looks like everybody's filtered back in for the most part. So I have uh, 729. It is Tuesday, September 21st, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the City of Columbus Committee of the Whole. Um, and with that, our City Clerk, Pat uh, Goebel, will take the roll call. All right. Here. Arnold? Here. Gray? Present. Mora? Present. Piperone? Here. Reed? Here. All present. Thank you. And this meeting was properly noticed. So next up on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Um, does anybody have any comments or alterations? All right, I'd take a motion to approve. I will make a motion to approve tonight's agenda. I'll second. Perfect, I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Awesome, thank you much. And moving on to citizen comments. Um, I have uh, Jack signed up. Did you want to speak now and answer questions later or did you want to, up to you for citizen comments? Or Keith, sorry. No, I oh, Lee does too. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Keith. And then was Jack? Jack, that was from before. This is before. Yeah. Okay. So this is the one that I want. All right. Ron, okay. Ron, I know, definitely wants to speak. And Lee Trask, did you want to speak during this as well? Oh, no, I didn't. No, okay. All right. Then run. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, you're, you're on. <laughs> uh, my name's Ron Curtis. I live at 100 Brookside Lane. Um, I'm here to talk on agenda item number six, which is the second Ward Creek stormwater update. And I also have comments from two other individuals in the neighborhood that I would like to then pass on to the council also. Um, first of all, I want to thank the council and the city for the opportunity to speak tonight. I want to thank you also for your attention to the long discussions that we've had about the, the creek uh, flooding. Uh, for proceeding with the updating of the previous creek flooding studies from 11 and 17 and for discussing the study update information tonight. I'm not going to go into the history. We've covered a lot of that in previous meetings. So. Um, I'm here in support of and to give brief comments for your discussion and consideration on whether the city will proceed with at a minimum some, if not all, of the recommended alternatives that are currently in the study update report. My comments are that I think the city should budget for and move ahead with culvert removal at a minimum. And you've heard that from me before. In the current study and the two previous studies, culvert removal has come up as a recommended and necessary change to have a big impact on reducing the creek flooding. The current study also puts emphasis on the culvert's deteriorating condition, condition suggesting removal or repair is imminent. So it's something we're looking at. The estimated costs have increased tremendously from the first to the current study as follows. The 2011 study estimate for removing the two culverts, one of which is now gone, the one by the deer pen, was at $152,000. The 2017 study estimate for removing two culverts, and again, the one by the deer pen is now gone, was up to $716,000. So a tremendous increase. Um, curiously enough, the one by the deer pen was removed for, as was noted earlier, somewhere in the range of $90,000. The current study estimate for removing the one remaining culvert is $835,000, which is a lot of money. It's worth noting that the current and the 2017 study estimates both included installing substantial length of 8 foot by 4 foot box culvert, 110 feet in, current, in the current study, 150 feet in the 2017 study, rather than removing the full length to an open ditch. This culvert adds tremendously to the cost. Excluding that culvert from the current study cuts the project cost of, of opening, removing the culvert, opening the ditch up in half. So it takes it from $800,000 down to roughly $400,000. Um, I'm not aware of why the culvert is necessary, and I'm guessing that's one of the things that perhaps would be discussed. I hope it's being discussed. During all three recommended changes, as Doing all three recommended changes is apparently the most desirable course, but much more expensive. However, as noted, the culvert removal cost can be reduced substantially by eliminating the box culvert. 
My understanding is the city is already committed to the downstream dredging, which is included in this study. Okay, that's, that's that CDBG grant um, project. They're already committed to that, moving forward with it, so that cost shouldn't be considered or added into this when you're looking at the stormwater flooding. That's already moving ahead, so we should be looking at either the upstream dredging and including the uh, culvert removal. <clears throat> Um, my understanding is the city has borrowing capacity and current borrowing condition rates are very favorable. Those are going to change. And I believe it is clear the city needs to address this second Ward Creek matter at some point and it seems clear that now is the time to budget for it. And I would hope that it comes up later on in your budgeting discussion. Thank you very much. <clears throat> then, um, from Jim and Liz Beck at 312 Fairway Drive. They say hi. Um, so you're looking at 1.5 million to correct the stormwater problem, and that 1.5 is the total in this study update, which that includes the, the downstream dredging, which I say should not be included in that number, because <clears throat> it's already committed to. Um, they say that they don't have school-aged children, but they have the privilege of sharing that expense with the school district uh, of updating the school. Uh, repaving various streets are able to share in that expense also. So they're wondering why they're not able, the community is not able to share in the expense of the stormwater problem that we have. Um, doesn't the farmland, the hospital, and our pack that are upstream continue, contribute to the flooding problem? It's always a question of where does the money come from? We raise the taxes for the above, why not for our situation? I'm the last person to want to increase taxes, but this affects too many residents and potentially their life savings and their health when flooding affects their homes with mold and debris. It's easy to say it doesn't affect me where I live, but if it did, I would want the help we are seeking. Um, okay, and that's, that's their comments. <clears throat> the next comments are from Max Chu, who lives at 321 Fairway Drive. Um, he said that uh, he appreciates the report in many great ways, and as an engineer, he's especially grateful for the raw data. Given such data is absolutely necessary and the need for solid reports is indisputable for education, educated decision-making, with the City Council considering the following three points. When was the last cost analysis on engineering costs through Rupert and Mielke as compared to hiring a full-time or part-time civil, civil engineer considered? When was the last comparison of end project costs against alternative firms? And will the City Council consider the cost of repeating the studies as part of the cost of the choice of inaction? Um, the primary function of city government is the protection, leadership, and stewardship of the city. Then as homeowners, I ask the city to protect the value of the city till it is through this robust engagement and fail not on the basics of safe, safety, safety critical infrastructure. Created layers plan to remove, the, created layered plans to remove the culvert. Everything else can wait. Max Chu. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. Awesome. And then um, moving on, we have the department reports. In your packet, you will see the department reports from um, the treasurer, the DPW, the fire department, library, life star, and police department. Anyone have any questions, comments, or concerns on any of those? Okay, perfect. Then next up um, is to review and discuss the second Ward Creek stormwater update. And we have Jason here with us tonight to go over it with us. Uh, good evening and thank you, Council and uh, Mayor. Um, I have um, a short presentation for you guys tonight on the report. Uh, there's a lot of information here that we covered in this update. So certainly if you have questions, let me know. Um, I think there's a few main points that I'd just like to emphasize. I know there's some questions um, you know, that we've heard brought up about uh, the report and, and some of the recommendations. So uh, hopefully we can talk a little bit more about those as well. So I think uh, kind of starting off here, uh, the, we kind of set out with this update to cover a few key things. One was to determine what the current conditions are. So we did some updated survey out there. We did some updated se sediment measuring. Uh, we did find, um, if you uh, did read through the report, we did find that there is uh, some changes to the sediment out there. We see a general, and again, I'm talking in general terms, but we see a general transition of more sediment from the upstream reaches into the downstream reaches. 
uh, with some of the heavy flooding events that would I think make sense um, with what we found out there um, we also uh, did update our stormwater model to reflect current conditions so that is um, going out and resurveying where the culvert was removed by the deer pen uh, also updating the model to reflect some of the changes that are coming in the highway 89 project uh, the real reason between uh, those couple updates was just to make sure our model was accurate uh, one of the concern is that as we allow more water to flow downstream you know we want to be ensured that we're not impacting downstream homeowners and, and causing a secondary issue uh, in that sense uh, that's not currently in existence so so we obviously did that and then uh, in addition to that we did some sediment sampling out there uh, this time around as well uh, one of the things that we think could contribute to significantly higher costs is if we have some level of contamination in those sediments uh, without um, any extensive previous sampling done throughout the city uh, you know we wanted to make sure that we had that information to ensure that our cost estimate was accurate disposing of contaminated sediment is um, tenfold more than you know non-contaminated sediment uh, so there's some good news I guess uh, to jump kind of into the sediment sampling uh, we did take six samples we did find some um, slightly high uh, zinc I believe it was and a little bit of lead in there but very marginally higher than the limits uh, that's relatively good some of that can be considered background for the most part but we do have to get things approved from the DNR but we feel pretty confident right now that this does not need to be handled special uh, we could do some type of land spread or land cover with the sediment so the good news is um, that was something that um, we were a little concerned about with some of the impaired waterways especially down towards the Mill Pond area so we did uh, find some uh, good results from that um, the other thing that we had looked at in some depth here was the costs um, and I'll, I'll get to the modeling in a minute but uh, we did look at the costs from the 2011 study Ron had touched on it a little bit uh, what we had done for the cost is we had gone back and looked at for the two dredging components both the upstream and downstream we recalculated the sediment quantities because that sediment had shifted and we wanted to verify that we had the right amount of sediment that there wasn't more or less in any one area and then we reevaluated in today's dollars so we went out and found similar type projects with with contractor bids for similar type volumes uh, located in this general southern Wisconsin area and confirmed prices on that and what we did find was the cost to remove the sediment the volumes were somewhat similar although like I said there was a shift but the costs were fairly consistent with the old reports once we updated the numbers uh, we were fairly happy with um, the results of, of what we expect the cost to be and we're, we're pretty confident that we have those costs pretty well maintained um, or pretty well established in this report uh, as far as far as the um, as far as the park removal primarily the large uh, culvert uh, that runs from the middle of the park up to the golf course uh, that was in the 2011 study uh, we had originally looked at that cost as being seven hundred fifteen thousand dollars and and to to I mean I guess address the the comment that Ron had brought up there was a larger diameter culvert that has much more capacity than the existing culvert that we put in there and if you recall the reason was to maintain that access road around the football field for security and and you know emergency response reasons we also wanted to maintain uh, a kind of a land bridge by the pool parking lot the the ditch because of the grades if we remove that 48 inch pipe the ditch would become about nine or ten feet deep and at the top it might be 40 feet wide so that would obviously impact and we would lose parking in that parking lot we could realign the ditch or slide that slightly but we'd still have to remove the old pipe for fear of collapse and sinkholes that you know would erode in the future so our thought was we'd be replacing the pipe with where it is today with the with the open ditch um, so that's why we had put in those those two box culverts so we took the 2017 study and just inflated it through a construction cost index and we came up with a new total cost of about 817,000 uh, also what we did for that price is we went back because the county had provided us uh, a reasonable cost to remove the culvert down by the deer pen that was a much smaller dig it was a, a shallower less material to remove uh, and I think with the watering we came in I think the, the final number with all the pumping was a little over a hundred thousand dollars but 
we asked them to kind of price this because we want to make sure that if there's a way that the county can achieve it cheaper than our original estimate, you know, we wanted to verify and kind of true that up. Our original estimate in 2017 was based on information that we had provided out to contractors and got contractor quotes back. So it wasn't Rupert Milky just, you know, trying to establish this pricing. It was essentially a bid. Um, the county, uh, we had met with the county on site and had gone over the plans and the plan was provided in the back of the report for everybody to look at. And we provided that same plan to the county. And with all of the costs uh, associated with what we accounted for, and again, this does include the box culverts, uh, they came back at 835000 So we were relatively comfortable that as we have the plan designed and have we have it anticipated, that's the cost. Now, we certainly could change that number by, you know, eliminating the culvert crossings or, um, you know, doing something different in essence of maybe moving the channel. Uh, but again, I think there's still going to be some added costs. You might save some, but you add some. Uh, there's also the thought that, um, you know, if you want that connectivity in the park, um, you know, you may lose that by taking out the culvert. You certainly have the connectivity down by the deer park. You could maintain one on the other end, but the whole center of the park would kind of be split by this channel. So there are some things to consider there, but I just wanted to make sure that we were looking at apples to apples with the cost from the old plan uh, to the new update, and then we were obviously updating those costs. So uh, we feel pretty confident that the costs are accurate. Uh, so kind of back to the modeling, uh, we did look at several scenarios with the modeling, um, actually quite a few that we updated in the modeling, and, and we did provide some graphs. I know the graphs were a little hard to determine here, uh, but we tried to talk about it in the narrative a little bit. Um, we felt certainly that, as mentioned, the best option would be to do all of the work. It would make sense that every, everything that you do helps improve it, so cumulatively it would have the biggest effect. Um, we also looked at, um, you know, kind of what the downstream effect would be, and that was kind of what I had mentioned earlier. Is this going to cause a problem downstream? Uh, we were happy to report that the model is, is showing us minimal disruption downstream. The only thing that we saw when we make, start making all these improvements is we saw a slight rise upstream of James Street, and we suspect, or we've had suspected for a while that we do have some limited capacity in the culvert under James Street, currently in its existing condition. This kind of, the model reinforced it by telling us the more water we're pushing down there, we're going to start seeing water backing up behind that culvert. At this point, I don't know that it was significant enough to damage structures, um, but we do see a rise down there when we start opening everything up. Uh, we are talking the 100-year flood, so it's a significant amount of water coming down there. And so that's one thing that I think in the report that we talked about it, it would probably be worth a little closer look to shoot some elevations down there and look at our model elevations just to make sure that uh, if we are seeing a rise that it's not going to be, you know, flooding into homes or something if you make a change upstream. So we would just caution the city, uh, you know, with that in mind. Uh, the other things that I guess come out of uh, the, the recommendation is we saw a fairly significant impact from the upstream dredging. Uh, one of the reasons that we believe that that's the case is we're seeing a much larger volume for storage of water up there. So we're opening up and we're taking out quite a bit more sediment. Uh, that's also going to make the water transport easier or quicker through that area because we're opening that up. We're getting rid of those kind of those shoals that form along the edge that are uh, that the grass grows on. You know, that's all impeding the flow of water. If we can get that cleaned out, we can open it up. We gain that storage. We gain that capacity to move that water through the system. Uh, so we did see the model telling us that that's going to have a significant impact. Uh, the culvert removal probably didn't have as much impact as I suspected. Now. And again, we kind of addressed this in the report. And one of the things that I think is at play here that we're not seeing the impact is, uh, we think what's happening with that culvert right now is that what's restricting the flow is a lot of the debris. So the debris washes down and maybe clogs the upper stream end of the culvert, maybe 50% of the capacity. And that's what's causing the water to back up and rise much quicker. Our model doesn't necessarily look at a clogged or a percent capacity reduction on that. We're just modeling the culvert at a full percent because we don't have the ability necessarily to model that, that case. So when we looked at the culvert uh, removal, uh, we certainly don't disagree that it's going to have an effect, but the model told us it wasn't as much as we were hoping to see. Uh, but I think what we have to look at is, and I, I mentioned it in the report, that there's probably a bigger impact removing the culvert than the model showing just because we're going to eliminate that potential for that debris to clog up and back water up. So it's a little hard to, to really, you know, get that answer 100% in here because 
some storms, and, and you know, we've seen this over the years that I've been here, some storms we have a lot of debris that will wash down and clog up that. In other storms, there's less debris. It, a lot of times it depends on you know, how much residual comes out of the cornfields. It depends on the time of year. Is there a lot of leaves? Is there brush or something in the creek that gets washed down? And so I think that's just kind of highly dependent upon how much is actually going to clog that culvert. Uh, I know we've talked to public works over the years about making sure that's a priority to maintain when we do have higher flows in the creek. Uh, but it's hard once it fills up and backs up and there's water there, it's obviously a dangerous situation too. So I think there's certainly support for removing the culvert uh, as well. Um, but I just want to kind of point that out because when you look at the graphs and you look at the data, you don't necessarily see that dramatic of an impact from the culvert removal. Uh, but we do believe that there's a bigger benefit there and that's, you know, eliminating that clogging problem. So, so that's the the sampling, the updating, the cost estimating, the modeling. Um, I guess with that, that kind of covers all the high points. Was there any questions um, that anybody had regarding the report or anything that came out of the report that I can clarify? Um, yeah, actually, I have a question. Um, so I'm not, obviously I'm not an engineer. So you mentioned something about removing the box culvert and reducing the cost of the, the work. Can you explain that a little bit? So um, what the plan, what we sketched up as the plan would be to put in a box culvert at the headwaters of where the culvert is now. So we'll take out the 48 inch culvert and we'd put in a much, oh, sorry, much larger eight by four foot box culvert. So that has multiple times the capacity of the current pipe less likely to clog because it's a very large open area, it wouldn't have a grate on or anything like that. The reason we did that is we had planned to, to maintain that access road around the football field. Because if we, if we take that 48 inch pipe out, there's going to be an open channel there now. There's going to be no way to cross that. Um, now, it's certainly up to the city if you want to maintain that or eliminate it. We could certainly do that. We could eliminate that. The second place that we had a box culvert installed was down by the pool parking lot. So kind of past the batting cages if you're familiar with that area. And the idea there would be that if you had a crossing point in the park where you could get from the high school or you could get from the pool parking lot where people park to access the park, they'd either have to walk all the way down where the deer pen is or they'd have to walk all the way back up where the golf course is to, to cross that channel. Um, that certainly is something that the city could consider. but also, if we opened up that channel, we put the culvert by the, the parking lot for the pool because the channel is going to be so wide, we're going to end up getting in, encroaching on the parking lot. We're going to have to take some of that parking out to create the slope for the channel. And so you would probably lose, uh, and I guess I'm estimating here, you might lose six, eight stalls in that parking lot um, just due to the fact you'd need that set back a little bit for safety reasons and things like that. So, so the culverts were planned in there. Um, Certainly they're expensive and they could be removed as part of the project, but I just want to be honest with the city that if you're removing them, you're really eliminating that accessibility into the park from those, you know, exterior areas. So. Thank you. And Mary, did you have a question? Well, uh, you know, we've heard some, some concerns expressed by citizens who live in that area tonight. And, uh, and I, I wonder, um, you know, like Shelly said, I'm not an engineer either. Do you think your plan addresses the concerns that we've heard from people from the neighborhood tonight in terms of well <laughs> um is it going to be a, a a plan that will alleviate some of the issues that that were brought up during the comment time um i don't know if i'm being specific enough but. yeah i i think my, my position on that is going to be, you know, we're looking at it from, you know, uh, try to be an objective point of view. You know, what, what would help the most? And the modeling is telling us that the upstream dredging is going to help the most. Um, I do believe that the culvert removal is important because it's deteriorating. Um, I do think that opening up that creek would also help more than the model's telling me. And again, I just want to be honest that, you know, what we're seeing in the engineering report may be not the whole story. Um, so the one caveat to that, though, is, and I, I know the group understands this because I've talked to the group, is you're never going to eliminate the risk for flooding. There's always a risk, um, unless if we completely rerouted this channel around the city. Um, there will there'll always be the opportunity. I think what we're trying to do here is reduce the risk. And I think everything the city does reduces the risk. 
Um, you know, I, I know there was some comments earlier about some of the future, past projects didn't help, but I'm confident that they did. Now, I'm not saying that the storms we had were more severe or if they would have caused more damage if those features were in or not, I don't know. But I'm confident that, you know, the work, and I, I think I listed that at the beginning of the report, just to kind of recap, there's been work done in this channel um, to help reduce the flows out there. The, the big ticket items are removing this big piece of culvert, and that's obviously the highest cost. Uh, so I'm, I'm confident that as you continue to do work and make improvements on the channel, it will continue to help reduce that risk of flooding. Thank you. And Paul? <clears throat> Perhaps it's a dumb question, but you're talking the connectivity between one side and the other, and if you're getting rid of the culverts, um, it would make the ravine or the creek wider at some points. And you, and you want to maintain the conductivity. You're, are you referring to vehicular conductivity? Or could, could there be take out the culvert and let it widen like it need, wants to and then put like a pedestrian bridge to, sure. I mean, would that solve that problem? Absolutely, you could. You could put a bridge across there. Uh, depending on the span, um, you know, they make prefab pedestrian bridges. You can pour some footings. You can set it on top. Uh, but they come at a cost. And I honestly, I, I would... I'm not going to sit here and try and guess what the cost of a 50-foot span on a pedestrian bridge would be, but I, I can assure you that it's probably, you know, it's probably not going to be any cheaper than the concrete culvert. I mean, I did a, I, I, I did a, I did a pedestrian bridge years back, and I can't remember exactly, but I, I know there was a pretty healthy price tag on that too. So, you know, there's, you know, again, it depends on the type of bridge. Is it steel? Is it wood? You know, you know, is it prefabricated? You know, things like that. So. So we could certainly look at that option, but um, the pedestrian connectivity could certainly occur on the ends. But, you know, again, I'm, I'm trying to look at this as the standpoint of if we don't put the middle box covered in, then we're going to have more costs and lost parking on the pool surface as well that we'll have to kind of factor in. And, you know, you might save some costs, but you're going to bump some costs back up in my mind. And I can appreciate the fact that you don't know the, the cost, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot for that, but I'm just saying, would that solve the because the culvert you're saying is a, is a mechanism to really attract debris and um, potentially yeah. flood it up. Would the pedestrian bridge, assuming that cost is not like usually deal, would that eliminate a lot of the, um, the I guess, um, blockage? Yeah, it certainly could. Um, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. And one of the reasons why we went with a larger diameter box culvert was for the capacity and the, and the reduced blockage. I mean, if I have a if I have a 50 foot long span that's eight by four, I can see through it. You know, right now we, we have no idea what's going on in that 48 inch culvert. It's completely enclosed for 800 feet. So um, it's much easier to clean out. I mean, in low flows, we could get the public works crew down there. If there's some brush jammed in there, we could get that pulled out. So I think with the bigger culvert, the idea was to minimize the blockage risk. Um, now, would a bridge be better in a culvert? certainly could be because it's more elevated and you would run the less risk of having anything get trapped or having to funnel through a through a you know area or a you know blockage potential thank you thank you and Trina oh um, I guess I'm personally wondering for the sediment removal does the cost have more to do with uh, total volume that's removed or from the length um, of the area being covered and then um, what are we planning to dig down to I mean it goes from zero to 29 inches of, of gunk <laughs> yeah yeah so the sediment removal would really be kind of uh, a project that would would center around getting a contractor in there with a backhoe and scooping it out one of the things we'd likely do is try and do it, do it during a low flow event uh, frozen ground is usually preferable because it's less disturbance. You know, the, the sediments would still be able to be dredged out, but we could get vehicles on, you know, the edges of the banks without tearing up yards and things like that. So essentially you would just scoop them out and load them in a truck and, and haul them away. Um, you know, what we would likely do is, is you know, if it's a low flow event, you, you got sediment that's saturated with water, um, but you want to take it somewhere and spread it so it has a chance to dry. And then you'd have to, in this case, if, if we do have uh, permit issues with the DNR requiring us to cover it, we'd have to strip somewhere and bury it. So there's costs associated with all those activities. So it's the removal, the trucking, and, and the disposal area, and the recovering and reseeding you know, of those areas. My hope would be that 
if we did some sediment removal, we would find, be able to find one of the pieces of city land that we currently own. Uh, I know we own some across the railroad tracks. I know we own some out by the Commerce Center that would be suitable for land spreading. Um, that way, you know, uh, I think we were estimating a couple thousand cubic yards. It's not a large volume, but you know, certainly we could dispose something that, like that on city land at a much cheaper cost and not have to pay somebody or, or you know, deal with a, you know, a different landowner. So. Uh, that would be something that we'd certainly look into for, for the dredging piece. Anyone else have any questions or comments for Jason? Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. Um, and I, I, there's a lot of good that came of the study. It's awesome that we probably won't have an issue with any sort of contamination in the sediment. That'll definitely help. Um, did the council have thoughts on how they may like to proceed or what you may like to do or move forward? Go ahead, Shelley. So I really think I, I really think we need to do something because like the gentleman said, we've been talking about this for how many years. And when I went through the plan, I thought, okay, yes, it's expensive, but I think we need to do it. And whether that means we have to borrow for it or we have to, or, or the stormwater utility passes or whatever, but I do think we should put it in the budget and get going on it. That's my personal opinion. Thank you. Yeah. And I mean, my entire time on council, I've been very much for doing something about our stormwater. So I, I definitely agree. Um, I personally think that starting with the upstream dredging and culvert removal and not putting in the box culverts would be my way that I would go we can always add in land bridge or something in the future mm -hmm. to reconnect i think mm -hmm. trying to save trying to get it done the most cost effective way for now would be great um budget season is coming so that is something that we could give staff kind of a direction of we would like to see something like this and how we could potentially pay for it in our budget coming up if that's what the council is wanting from staff there. Is, go ahead, Trina. Oh, uh, oh goodness. I mean, I'm very much for the culvert, um, you know, improvements and getting up the, getting up all the gunk out. I, I just don't think we'll be able to do a whole lot in the current budget season. I think once we see everything laid out that needs to be covered, it'll be uh, a little disappointing. But I, I think we should try and see if we can make a, a small start. Right, it, it, at least a start. And I mean, it would be lending and I'm sure Kyle and everyone else can give us a few options of how to pay for it. it it's definitely not something that we can afford to take out of our budget. Like we can't just fork over a million dollars or however much money. We don't have it. Um, but we could look at what we could potentially do for borrowing. We could look at, even though it's not popular, um, potential um, uh, special assessments. Uh, we There's a lot of things that we could look at to pay for it. It's more of, do we want to see this as options in our budget so that we can give staff a direction on if we want this to be included or not? It, I, I would say there's multiple ways we could potentially do it and pay for it and multiple things that we could we could do portions, we could plan it out, but it's more of what do we want to see? Sarah? I'd like to see the project occur, but I would like to see our financing options before we decide how to move forward. I think that's prudent. Yeah. Shelley? Yeah, I agree. Is that enough direction for you, Kyle? Uh, just uh, to be clear, is is there a preferred option so we know sort of which dollar amount we're targeting for financing? I personally would like at least one of the options to be upstream dredging and removal without putting in the new box culverts. That's that's my preferred option if we can do it. Um, so I would definitely like that to be an option. Maybe also an option of only upstream dredging and then of course an option of everything. But I think I don't know if making removing the culvert without dredging would really make a lot of sense. So I think we kind of have to do dredging and culvert remover, removal or start with upstream dredging, in my opinion. But Pete, oh, or, Paul. Paul, sorry. No problem. 
Um, <laughs> I concur with Elder um, Gray um, regarding um, the dredging and the elimination of the, um, the box culvert, and then later on, you know, in a different budget time, we want to put a connectivity bridge. That I think those are, you know, both attractive and useful, but um, doing one without the other would really make no sense at this point. So I concur with Elder Gray. Trina, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, uh, I would definitely want to get a couple of prices, even really generic ones, to find out what um, uh, different types of connectivity bridges for both pedestrian or um, vehicles might cost before removing the cover culverts, just to uh, see what we might be looking at in the future. Oh, sure. uh, I just wanted to say that I do like Paul's idea for the bridge. I actually thought that would, that would be kind of nice. And I just want to remind everybody, we do have 4th of July down there. So if we make it too difficult for people to get around, that might be, um, we might have some angry citizens with that too. So. Right. Yeah. I mean, personally, I prefer inconvenience than my house getting flooded, even though I'm not one of the people that are directly affected. But I think it's something that could be added later um, in I, if perhaps it's something that even if it's a pedestrian bridge, it could be a, a fundraiser that happens in the future. There could be a lot of ways to do it. I don't know if it's necessary to do it. In my view, um, doing something about stormwater and helping to alleviate flooding in our city is an immediate need. A bridge is not an immediate need for people to walk over. That's just my opinion. But I do think we should have options for to see what the cost would be in the future, um, but perhaps doing it all at once, and for doing just the dredging or the dredging and the removal. So kind of so we can see and how we would pay for it, I think is the biggest question, how we can actually move forward. A couple options for that. I, I know assessments aren't awesome, but perhaps an assessment of some sort um, as one of the options to pay for it. I support that. Perfect. Is that good direction for you, Kyle? Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much, Jason. I, it's very appreciated. Um, and thank you, Ron. Let's see here. Then next up we have two, 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 number seven, review and discuss butterfly trails, volunteer park, and community gardens. And Kyle or Matt's going to start us off real quick. All right. So uh, this past summer, uh, when we were talking about the uh, butterfly trails, volunteer park, uh, the concept of having the community gardens located out here was discussed briefly at council. Uh, based on that conversation. Um, staff uh, reached out to the community gardens to see, to kind of gauge their interest that they would be interested in moving from their current location on Tower Drive uh, to the uh, Butterfly Gardens down on River Road. Um, based on our uh, initial discussion with the community gardens, they would definitely have interest in, in moving uh, down to the uh, Butterfly Trails Volunteer Park. Um, and just a basic conversation we had with them, they indicated they would be uh, needing about 25 plots to start with, and the plots would be 15 by 15. Um, so the, the 15 by 15 also includes like the walkways to get to your, to your plots. So you're talking uh, 5,625 uh, 5, square feet total. Um, so that, I mean, that's less than a quarter acre mm -hmm. that they would uh, be taking up. Uh, when we were talking with them also, I think uh, DPW expressed that with the, uh, there's some uh, benefit with the, um, uh, uh, the, the recycling center nearby with mulch. They're always looking for, for folks that would be using mulch. And I think there's some, some efficiency to be gained from that. And uh, the, the other thing I guess I'd want to mention is that um, when the uh, uh, the park was first formed, it, a lot of it was based around it being an educational opportunity for the community. And based on what I know of the community garden, I think this would, would build upon that. Um, I, I do want to note that uh, there has been uh, some concern uh, with the community gardens being located here. 
um, from from some of the odd fellows themselves and also some of the neighbors in, in the uh, um, nearby uh, condos on the green I believe so I, I guess with that I have you I'm here for questions but we also have uh, Susie from the community gardens she can answer any questions that you may have and I do believe we have somebody from the odd fellows oh you moved right behind me sorry um, that could um, so with that I guess I'll sit down Awesome. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, did uh, you, Susie or Keith, did either of you want to add anything or just answer questions from council? Go ahead, Keith. Um, so thank you. I'm Keith Lepno. I'm with the Odd Fellows. Um, I'm one of the uh, couple guys that spent a lot of hours out there last year tilling and tilling and tilling and driving in circles. And um, this year we've been doing weed control and things are coming along nice. So. Um, to be very honest, up front when I was uh, driving around in circles, I was kind of like, yeah, it's, you know, it's a neat project, but I wasn't really thinking, I guess, where Winfield was at, and he kind of had the vision for this. I think he's been here in the past. Um, then it dawned on me one day that we've got Larson House right across the street, and it'd be kind of nice if you're visiting mom or dad there, or grandma and grandpa, to be able to take them across the street, get some fresh air. It's not a huge area. Um, you don't know, see some butterflies, and the river's right there too. And so I think the thing that, that started to hit me more is there's a, it's a good asset. Um, I know Winfield would like to see kayak, canoe launch, and cleaning up the riverbank and all that. And so I think one of the things to consider is just what does that end vision start to look like? And I think some of you have been out there and looked through it, so thank you for doing that and taking that time. Those that haven't, I guess I'd ask you to go out there and take a look. Because the number of hours that I was out there, I guess it started to hit me more and more how nice this could be for the community. I'm sure it would draw people from um, surrounding communities for photography, you know, if it's bird watching, butterflies for sure. I mean, we see that at Albrook Gardens when the butterfly exhibit is there, people flock there. So there's opportunities there. I would say that as I was working up the land too, I saw people already using it and it's really not nice yet. It's basically a field with stuff starting to grow. And so people are already using it to go walk, to go fishing, to launch kayaks and canoes. So even in the state that it's in, it's already an asset and I think it can only become that much greater. So I'll be here for questions. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you so much, Keith. Uh, did you have anything to add up? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, as everyone can see, the, uh, the area that the community gardens would be taking up isn't even really in the butterfly gardens. It's across the drive, across from the parking lot going toward the treatment plant. So it shouldn't really affect it. Is go ahead. Conceptual. conceptual. Go right. I just kind of picked a spot and tried to figure out what was 15 by 15 by 25. Where it could fit. Right. Uh, you know. So that's, it could be moved if needed. Okay. Yeah. Right. Perfect. Thank you. And do you think that location would work for you guys, Susie? Yes. Awesome. Does anyone up here have any questions or comments or what are, oh. Well, Susie, maybe you could just, for those of us, I mean, I'm fairly familiar with, with the community garden, but I, I'm not sure everybody else is. And um, are, is there a lot of activity there? Are there, I drive by fairly often and I, I, I mean, it always, you know, looks great with all the tomatoes and everything. Um, I don't often see people there, so it doesn't look like it's the kind of thing where you're going to have a lot of people parking and doing other stuff. Can you kind of talk about, sure. There should be a post-it note up there, is it? It's like a face with some sound waves coming out. Yeah, okay. there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so. I and Arlene Lucan sort of unofficially manage the community garden and have for a few years. And as with anything, our uh, membership fluctuates. There was a time in the past 15 years where we had like 40 members and 40 people working on plots, and then it dropped. But recently, I guess sort of an unintended consequence of COVID is lots of people are interested in gardening now. So we have about 
a little less than 20 gardeners now. Um, kind of the benefit with people, you know, it's a visible part of the community. We have gardeners that are coming early in the morning. We have retired people coming in the middle of the day. Um, the students from Discovery Charter School will come in the fall and the spring, and then people that come in the evening. Um, I talked to Matt too, at most, there's like three to five cars that will park on the road at our current location or in the rehab center parking lot. So there's never a huge crowd of people because we can work there kind of whenever it fits our schedules. And you're open to anybody can participate? Absolutely. We have a range of ages and abilities. We've noticed um, where we're at now, and we've been there, it's got to be close to 15 years. Some of the residents at the rehab center will come down and watch us and ask us questions. So moving over um, on River Road, like there's condos and apartments there and other ways that we can engage people that might have mobility issues in gardening. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, go ahead. I guess Paul. this is... <laughs> or Pete. <laughs> you choose. Um, I, I just... I, I'm, we all received the um, the petition from the town of Zunder Green saying that they're against it. Do we know? I, I didn't, maybe I didn't read it or I didn't see it, but I didn't see any indication of why there was an opposition to it and what what that was because it, everything it sounds like it's such a great idea. So, but obviously they have a reason. Do we know the reason for not wanting it? Keith, do you have any idea why there was a petition against having community garden? right next to the butterfly garden? I, I don't. Um, I know that there is one person from the condos that is over there and is a huge fan of the butterfly garden. I don't, I, I really don't have any background though if, if okay. there's opposition because of that. I, I have nothing, I have nothing. All right. Okay. I imagine they would, were thinking that it was going to take up part of the butterfly garden and weren't a fan of that. But like, especially if it can fit here, like where Matt, or, placed it potentially I, I don't see how it would even impact anything but um, did you have anything to add about that Matt yeah I, I don't think the petition actually came from anybody from the odd Fellows. I think it was from uh, some of the, the condo uh, or some of the folks living in the condos near the butterfly trails that's I just want to clarify that because I don't think it was um, any to, or at least to my knowledge, I don't think it was from the ad follows themselves. I, I, I know, and I know, I guess to clarify, um, I've heard Winfield and others share comments that they, they, they think it fits here. Actually, I think Winfield said this when uh, the last time he was here with, with council. Um, I, I, it's not really clear if the entire ad fellows agree with, with that perspective, but there's clear that there is some concern with this being located there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matt. Well, and Keith, can I, and I'm just going to ask you one more time, is it going to be a problem for the uh, Odd Fellows? Uh, um, I mean, so the Odd Fellows is a, is a group, and so there's some people that don't want it there and, and some that, frankly, don't care. Okay. You know, and so it's, it's mixed. I, don't, I wouldn't say that the Odd Fellows as a group have okay. a stance as a group. All right. That's good to know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. Trina, do you have something to oh, add? Oh, uh, no, just the same thing you were saying. Uh, initially, I was against the idea of taking away from some of the butterfly space for the community garden, but seeing it on the opposite side of the little road and um, looks like they have some room to grow, I'm very much for it. Uh, oh, did have a quick question. Do the community garden people... Um, till the ground themselves would that be their responsibility so historically we've asked um, high school FFA members or literally anyone that has a tractor and is willing to drive it into town to do the first till in the spring um, beyond that each member is kind of responsible for their own pl plot as far as cleaning things up um, and then we talked with the city that if there needs to be lawn that's dug up until they would help with that for that initial prep of the plots. Perfect. Thank you. Um, was there anything that you would need from the city in addition or anything of that nature? Or would it be pretty self-sufficient? 
Ideally self-sufficient, yes. Okay, perfect, thank you. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I did want to ask um, about your water excess plan. Yes, so um, currently we have two 500 gallon tanks that we fill with the hydrant that's right on the corner by the rehab center. So um, depending on the weather, Columbus Water and Light will hook up the hydrant for us to use just commercial hoses and then I fill those tanks, which are run by gravity, and we have additional hoses there. So I did talk with Matt and the others about, in some fashion, either using the effluent or a hydrant if that's nearby to fill those tanks to keep that um, available for the members too. Perfect, thank you so much. Anybody else? Any? So um, then how would the council like to move this forward then any it sounds like everybody's in support of the community gardens being utilized in the same area. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Anything else you need from us for that? I, I don't think so. I would imagine we would do something similar to the butterfly uh, garden where there'd be some sort of MOU that really lays out mutual expectations. And uh, so I would expect that would be sort of the next formal step that would uh, you'd see. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Then moving on, um, let's see here. Do, do, do. Number eight, review and discuss the process for filling council vacancies. So as everyone knows, um, Paul unfortunately moved into District 1. Um, or Pete. But, uh, <laughs> right? Well, Pete did, so Paul could stay. No, but um, so Paul will, his last meeting will be October 19th with us and Mike McCabe recently resigned. Um, both of them have vacancies that are, um, their terms will be coming back up in April right away. So it is a very short term vacancy to fill. But since we have two and we're going into budget season, I think it is something that we should do because that's basically all of us would have to never get a sniffle or we wouldn't have a quorum. Um, so uh, with the limited time, um, the mayor and I were talking, so we've done it a bunch of ways. I was personally, I was appointed my first time on council and that process took several months and I don't think we have that kind of time. And so what we were talking about is, and what I would like to put forward to fill the vacancies is each council member could nominate um, an alder for each district and then at the, then we would as a council vote until we had a representative for each district. How's the, and now I'd like some feedback from you guys, what you think about that or, go ahead. Can, um, I'm just gonna comment here because I was on school board for nine years and we had a couple of unexpected uh, vacancies. Um, and one way that we dealt with it was to um, appoint people who were not interested in running for the seat when the election uh, season came around because we were concerned that if we appointed somebody who then wanted to run, that person would have sort of an unfair advantage um, because they'd kind of be, you know, the incumbent. And um, so we, we looked for people who um, had uh, experience maybe on other boards or committees um, and appointed them and, uh, and that worked out well for us. I had the thought that perhaps we could look at former alders who went through a budget season um, who have no interest in running in the, in the April election but who could step in and you know help us out for five months um, until April when, when two new alders can be elected. So that's one thing I was just gonna throw out there. Right, and I think um, Mayor Arnold has a good point, uh, you know, electing or appointing people that um, weren't intending to run or that does definitely have its, its validity. I do want to make sure everyone on council understands that each of you will have the opportunity to nominate people though. Like we don't need to agree on who we nominate. We just need to vote until we have one nom one person in each district. Um, but go ahead. Well, well, if we decide to go that route, that's, go ahead, I'll, Paul. I know um, I, I have reached out to um, former alderman uh, of District 2 already and 
One was not interested, but he put um, parlayed that message to a different one, and he said he contacted the mayor. So uh, I, I agree with you know, like, you know I don't think he'd be ever interested in running again. But you know, just to fill the gap, I think there's some hopefully interest in that. I, I I just again want to point out that we really don't want to talk about who we're nominating or anything right now. I just really want to iron out the process that everyone feels appropriate. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's really appropriate for us to talk about who we may want to consider nominating as individuals at this moment. So, um, go ahead, Shelley. So can you just give, give us an example of what you mean? So you want each of us to pick somebody for District 3 and District 2 to kind of put in a pool, and then we pick from that way? Is that what you're uh, initially saying? Kind of. So you don't have to nominate someone if you don't have someone to nominate. I just think that each of us should have the ability to nominate because I don't want any one of us um, to kind of cherry pick who we think should it should be. So um, if you think there's someone in District 3 or District 2 that would do a good job, you can reach out to them, see if they would accept your nomination and nominate them at our next meeting. And then if we have one nomination per district that makes it pretty easy to vote if we have two or three we just vote until we have one if that if that's what i'm proposing at least if that makes sense okay how do you feel about that process sounds good to me i just think it's a expediated process and i think we need to do it quickly yeah. um anybody else have any thoughts go ahead trina oh uh yeah i think we you know need to try to move as quickly as possible. Hopefully it will be a past alder person um, due to it being right in time for budget season and uh, we just don't have the four or five months to get someone ready mm -hmm. to be able to make decisions, especially since the opening is only for around five or six months. So I'm very hopeful hopeful that we'll be able to find some of the experienced personnel that might be willing to donate a couple uh, couple evenings uh, for a couple months. <laughs> right. Yeah, I agree. That would be an ideal situation. Do you think and that that process will work well? I think, think it should the... work. I'm wondering if we should get a couple of sentences from each person to bring in. I don't know how much um, we could expect the person to be able to just come in in two weeks. Right. But it would be good if we had like a little short bio for introducing them. Right, and um, actually Mayor Arnold and I did talk about that. I, I think if they have something prepared for us at the, so basically what I'm proposing is all of us reach out if we know someone that would like to and have them prepped for the next meeting so that they have you know something ready to like a brief two three minute um kind of bio basically that they can stand before us talk to us and then be prepared to answer questions um perhaps each council member should we have a limit of questions per council member do you think or just open questions to them back is there any direction you guys I mean, it, this is open. This is, there is, so I want to be clear, there is no procedure or proper way of doing this. So this is open to us deciding how we're doing this. I'm just putting out what I think is the fastest, most effective way of doing it. I um, think we should limit the amount of questions. Different candidates may have different things that you may want to ask or that I may want to ask. So okay. I think we should be as thorough as possible. That's fair. Anyone else? Um, I, I guess just because I know things are going to get really busy with the budget, um, maybe it would be good for us to just think about those some kind of basic questions that we want to ask people. Um, you know, why do you want to be on council for the next five months? Uh, have you had any experience serving on a, a board or a committee before? Um, something pretty basic. Um, that, yeah. I, I think that could, that's um, a good point. Maybe a basic question and then maybe like, or, I mean, I think a lot of this will probably come down to just us being respectful of time of mm -hmm. both the people here and everyone else. 
Um, I think the hard thing about coming up with questions ahead of time is they're going to speak to us and depending on what they say may influence right. what we want to ask them is the hard part. Um, so, I, I think being prepared like Mayor Arnold is saying so that you know we can keep it concise and to the point and try to get this similar information out of everybody is super valid. And so a good perhaps idea. could we ask mm -hmm. um, potential candidates to maybe just introduce themselves and give them you know a couple of minutes to give us their elevator speech <laughs> right and then if if they haven't covered you know some of the areas that we think are important mm -hmm. we can ask have time to ask them right that's that's what I think I think that'd be that'd work out well um, Trina I think you had oh, yours first I yeah I'm going to continue on with the mayors I, I think we should just ask for a quick introduction and then ask what experience they have with um, you know previous committees and um, any kind of municipal budget experience just to keep it really really short we could add on a why they're interested but I, i'd want to keep it pretty concise keep it short and then it maybe allow each alder to probe a little bit deeper if they bring up something like still allow i i want you i want everyone because we're not going to like someone that i nominate shelly may not know or someone that shelly nominates um it, it, you know we won't so i i don't want to limit us too much to be honest um but i think if they come up and they speak for a couple minutes that will give us the opportunity to gauge what we as an individual need to ask them um, but as us as individuals should we limit ourselves to one or two questions per person or just kind of be respectful and not need to limit ourselves uh, go ahead, Paul. Um, I, I'm, I'm sort of listening to everyone, whatever we're saying. I think um, the, uh, a great solution or um, compromise, if you will, is um, like an introduction, all right, and then like two or three standard questions that everybody would receive, and then you know, like, and then if that does not answer the questions that we may have, then we could also per alderman or uh, t council person, I'm sorry. Um, um, Ask one or two follow-up questions that, that we want to tailor to that person because you know it may not be necessary. They may have answered in their intro, but allow us the, the ability. You know, so so again, like intro, two or three standard questions, and then we can feel our own questions at the end. That makes sense. Yeah. And, yeah. and my my only comment was going to be that having a list of questions would probably be better so that we don't duplicate the time. You know, so we don't duplicate questions or re-ask a, a question of maybe just a different way. Okay, so my my thought of how this process will work is it'll be our next um, regular meeting. So Mayor Arnold would be leading that meeting, of course. How do you all feel if Mayor Arnold asks, you know, a preset of basic questions to each, if they didn't already answer those basic questions in their introduction, because they may answer them themselves to be quite honest um if she starts by asking the every person the same questions if they haven't been answered already and then it opens up to council to ask individual questions does that make does that kind of cover the gambit of what we've been talking yes yeah, yeah. is that comfortable for you ouch so that will not be a question <laughs> um but so it seems like everyone feels comfortable with that coming to our next regular meeting. Uh, just uh, two questions for uh, uh, for clarity. So uh, the October fifth regular meeting for this um, with the district three vacancy, will that person be appointed um, immediately and be seated, or would that be the next meeting that they would um, attend, or in between the regular and the committee of the whole? Uh, and then uh, just a, a reminder that uh, Alder Pyferone. Uh, his resignation is effective after the meetings on October 19th, so the person selected won't begin uh, to serve until after the meetings on October 19th, just for so everyone's on the same page. Thank you so much for clarifying that. I meant to bring that up. Um, so uh, the one alder could start immediately if we wish. I, in my opinion, it probably makes the most sense that if they want to give them the option of, you know, are you ready to sit up here right now or do you want to come start the next meeting 
if they do want to, I think probably swear them in between the two meetings is logical. Yeah, technically, if they are seated but not sworn, they can't vote. Right. Um, but that's a, uh, I mean, in between meetings would also work. I just, so we know what to expect, and uh, I just want to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Right. And, of course, the other person that would be replacing Paul can attend all of our meetings. They just wouldn't be able to vote or be sworn in until after that meeting. Uh, Trina? Oh, um, my preference would be to have both of the new alders wait until the following meeting. I just don't think that anyone would likely be all that prepared, not knowing if they're going to be the chosen person or not. Right, and I can sympathize with that. I was in that position before, and I was asked if I wanted to be sworn, and I was like, I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, yeah, I mean, it's maybe just putting it out to the next meeting so that we don't put them on the spot and ask them. That's, I think that's probably, yeah, I, would agree I would agree. That. So everybody in agreement, we vote, but then they don't start till the next meeting. And then one would start the next meeting, be able to actually vote and be there. Um, and then the other would just be attending. But does that make sense? Awesome. Well, then, m moving on to the next. All right. So, uh, item number nine is to review and discuss the street name change for Nina Drive. And Matt's going to tell us a bit about that. Sure. So, earlier this year, uh, Council approved a CSM creating uh, two uh, four-lot divisions that resulted in six, uh, or that will result in six single-family homes out on Nina Drive. Uh, when staff was looking at this, one of the things that came up was uh, if you've looked at the community trails subdivision and if you look at uh, the exhibit that's part of your packet, Nina Drive's a nice circular drive. Uh, one of the issues we noted is that there's a street here that's called Nina Drive and there's already a couple addresses there. And then you know, you're going to have Nina Drive over here and Nina Drive doesn't connect. Um, and being that this was platted in 2007, and that uh, we're already right now with these two CSMs further dividing this land. Staff is not 100% certain that what was platted in 2007 is what is going to be built. So we thought maybe instead of having two Nina Drives that never connect, maybe it's better to go through and just alter the name of Nina Drive. So we talked about it, and that is what is proposed before you. Um, and uh, one of the things to note is that what you see is called an affidavit of correction because this was platted, the street names were platted on a platted subdivision. So by state statute, you have to go through this process to basically correct the, uh, the, the street name. One of the things that staff came, came up with is just a slight change to just call it Nina Drive West because if they do connect, then it won't be as confusing. So it kind of it gives us flexibility. So essentially what, what we're asking is uh, basically move this forward for approval. Obviously the other alternative is always to do nothing, but we, we felt that with EMS and having the streets may not ever connect, it, we just felt this was the best course of action and the easiest way to, to fix this is this affidavit of correction. So with that, any questions? Yeah, perfect. Mayor Arnold? Are there actual houses already built with people living in them in the, on the newest part of the no Nina drive? They, they do there is a there's a building permit for one and the house is going up and it, they will not have final occupancy before this would be in, in incorporated so essentially when the 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 first house is is finalized out there and they get final occupancy we'll have uh, a new address and street name for them how, how difficult would it be to call it something completely different so people aren't confused? Well, with theoretically changes? speaking, now would be the time to speak, but uh, the staff, I think, wanted to uh, come up with something um, to kind mm -hmm. of avoid a street naming contest or anything of that regard. We, we wanted to move this in a somewhat quickly fashion, so. Okay. Kyle? Are, are there, I mean, like, are there already signs up and stuff? Mm -mm. Or not? Uh, I, okay. I'm not sure if there's uh, street signs, but I know one of the uh, factors that staff took into account was in the event this does get built, 
yeah, in the, in the manner that it's it. platted. Yeah. Uh, having Nita Drive connect to Nita Drive West or West Nita Drive uh, would make some logical sense, whereas if we had two completely different names that on a bend suddenly yeah. changed names, not that it doesn't happen other places in the city, uh, but this kind of preserved the best of both worlds, we thought. Uh, maintained the current houses with uh, their mailing address, changed mailing addresses for people that aren't there yet uh, so they wouldn't be inconvenienced, uh, and uh, preserve the possibility of reconnection at a later date. Thanks. That clears Everybody okay with that? I, I personally don't have any strong feelings, so if staff thinks Nina Drive and Nina Drive West are best, I'm all good with it if everybody else is. Sounds to me. All right. Perfect. I have one, one comment. Since oh. I'm now Pete, we call it Nina and Pinta. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that may have been discussed. Uh, yeah, I think <laughs> that's what I'm trying to remember because we were trying to think of a Native American name. Or Nina and Trina. Oh, hey. <laughs> and then if they joined, they could just take the tea. Well, okay, that wouldn't work. Well, and with that, uh, it's time for the fun portion of the night and review and discuss the city administrator's preliminary draft budget. All right, uh, so on the desk in front of you, you all have a lot of paper. I think it's uh, 37 or 38 pages. Uh, it consists of the draft uh, budget um, as well as a carryover log that, uh, that we can talk about in a little bit. Um, I want to highlight this is not only a draft budget, but it's a preliminary draft budget, uh, and uh, that really highlights the uh, the incomplete nature, the information that isn't out there yet to be uh, locked in, and uh, the estimates that we're having to put in, kind of that nature leads this to be something that will change. I think last year I said the only thing that's certain is that this will not be the budget we adopt, and I think that uh, holds true today also. Um, I just want to kind of touch on, you know, starting the process that um, I've put a lot of time into this, but, you know, behind me and supporting me in this effort is all the department heads that have put in an even greater amount of time collectively uh, working on the budget uh, all year long, really, identifying the needs and trying to figure out ways to, uh, to make it work with the funds uh, that we have. And so I just want to recognize their efforts because really that's the building block that gets this going. And... Uh, it's it's a difficult challenge because there are more needs than resources uh, every year um, and we're continuing to try to pick away at some of the the needs uh, and just always try to get better uh, but I, I can promise you that there's thousands of dollars of requests that are not in here mm -hmm. uh, because of the department heads recognizing there is only so much to go around um, so what I want to do is talk uh, just a little bit about the uh, some highlights from uh, the, the draft uh, budget that you have um, I'm not intending to go through exhaustively at this point because it is uh, in a draft form and there will be changes and you probably need to go and kind of pick it apart and develop a list of questions so that's kind of the uh, the format I think at this stage um, some of the unknowns uh, we have insurance costs uh, some of the state aids and transportation aids uh, that information is not out there yet um, uh, things like expenditure restraint numbers that we have to shoot towards, uh, those weren't out um, until after I wrote this. Now they're out uh, today. Uh, after uh, I had finished the budget, that's when I discovered that they had those numbers out, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but also things like our utility uh, payment in lieu of taxes, and then even updated department and, and fund information. The library has information in here, but it's draft. So uh, we expect that before they adopt it, they may make changes to theirs. Uh, cable and stormwater also uh, are in a very draft form. Um, so as the, the budget is before you, it includes a tax levy increase of $32,550. Uh, that's about 0.95%, so just a shade under 1%. Uh, the net new construction we had this year was 0.22%, uh, one of the lowest we've had in years, unfortunately. Um, on, uh, and Paul probably knows this from buying a house. Uh, the property values have been increasing, so uh, the values have increased about 3%, so the tax rate will come down even though the tax levy is increasing. So uh, that's kind of the, the nature of those multiple moving parts. The levy's going up. Uh, but the property values are increasing at a faster rate, so the tax rate applied to each dollar of property value goes down. 
Um, uh, speaking of that uh, expenditure restraint that I mentioned before, um, you know, we get all the way through this budget and I get all the numbers or most of the numbers balanced out and really um, kind of bridge a large gap. And uh, even though we had the $32,000 in levy increase, um, the way that we carry over funds that we currently have allocated to future years to cover expenses, uh, the expenditure restraint uh, number that we're shooting for, uh, now it looks like we'll need to cut $40,000 from the general fund budget. Um, I have some ideas on how to you know, work with that, uh, but that's the nature of how this budget is. It's, uh, you get it balanced and we're only increasing taxes by $32,000 and then based on kind of the mechanics of funding, we have to cut 40,000, which means we'd have to actually collect less taxes unless we uh, kind of work within that, that system. Um, so again, with what's gonna change, I know that I need to take at least $40,000 out of the budget you have in front of you. Um, you know, how that works and, and how we accomplish that, um, that's kind of something that I have some ideas on, but we have to work it through the steps and see timing wise and, and finance wise how we can do it. Um, so I'm gonna go through some of the information. The pages are numbered, but I really don't, like I said, I'm not gonna go through each line. Um, I, I want you to get a sense of where the budget is, a sense of some of the highlights. Um, I think some work sessions might be a, a good idea because I know that's been mentioned by council members to maybe dive in a little bit more into specific areas um, and learn kind of about the different elements of them or how they get to be what they are. I think that's a great idea. Um, so I look forward to uh, whatever might work out best for the council in that regard, uh, whether it's one group session or a small session or a combination. Um, so, um, just to kind of dive in a little bit on, on page one, I promise, like I said, not to be line by line. Uh, you can see the taxes for just the general fund portion in this are going up 29,000. Uh, there's some other levy increases in some of the other funds that receive money right from the tax levy, uh, that add to that to come up to the 32,000 that I mentioned earlier. Um, if you look at uh, even the state aid down in the second, uh, uh, second block there, the expenditure restraint uh, program, which is the number that I talked about where we have to cut 40,000 to stay within those limits. Um, uh, that's $7,000 less uh, estimated uh, payment than it was last year. And the issue there is that if you don't hit your expenditure restraint numbers, you lose that money in a future year. So if we don't cut the 40,000, we're gonna lose 80,000 in a future year. Um, and, and that's kind of how they try to, um, outside of levy, levy limits, control the amount of money you spend that's not tax dollar related necessarily. Um, uh, moving to page two, I uh, just wanted to point out, uh, there's some things like $25,000 in grant revenue that we had last year for the, uh, the, the tree removals, that's gone. Um, and then also at the bottom, uh, which is what, we, uh, what I was sort of referring to and how we fund this, um, the applied surplus, which is prior, prior year tax revenues that we've either saved or that we have um, not spent in this year for a variety of reasons. We had a lot of that with COVID uh, where training wasn't happening or something, you know, uh, we normally would have spent it, but we couldn't. And so we carry it to a future year. Um, uh, this year it was 92,500 um, and it's about 100,000 more uh, just based on some of the requests that we have, and I'll touch on uh, one of them in here that uh, is about uh, more than $50,000 um, worth. Uh, moving to the uh, page three, I uh, just wanted to point out the historic preservation. Uh, that's an estimated budget at this time. That's one of those that they're still working on. Um, the contingency account, uh, this year we were in the $55,000 range uh, to kind of make ends meet and uh, we had to lower that to under 40,000, which uh, hopefully is enough, but the, the whole point of the contingency fund is you never quite know uh, what's gonna come up. Um, uh, continuing on, and I guess if anyone does have a, a question already about anything, uh, I can address it. Otherwise, I think uh, either collectively uh, meeting and going over these or individual emails or phone calls back and forth are a great way to understand individual uh, questions. Uh, uh, moving to page six, I mentioned uh, one of the large expenditures uh, is in the PD field services uh, in the capital equipment. 
the police department, unfortunately, has had several vacancies of officers, and they've had some uh, recruitments for lieutenants, so there was vacancies. They wish they would have had the people in the positions. Uh, however, they don't, or they didn't, and so they've accumulated some excess money. Um, one of the things that they normally do is buy squad cars, and that would normally uh, come in the a normal capital expense item. Um, however, uh, the last couple times they've been able, with saved uh, salary money, uh, to purchase a squad. And that's what this money is. That's why it's such a large amount. Um, and that was also, that's included in the carryover then as revenue. The carryover revenue matches this expense to kind of balance them out. So, um, just kind of continuing to move through. Um, on page eight, um, the uh, the garage equipment replacement was 17,000 last year or current year uh, is going to 34,000. That's also a carryover. Uh, the repair that needs to be done on truck four couldn't be accomplished with 17,000 based on the box that they want to get for that. So they're carrying over the 17,000 and adding that same amount to accomplish the uh, the, the fix on truck four uh, in the coming year. But again, that's that money that adds up to that uh, large carryover. Um, uh, looking down uh, towards the bottom, I just want to point out we are maintaining the uh, sidewalk repair and maintenance budget line of thirty-three thousand. Um, that's something that we made a commitment to this year. We did a lot of sidewalks, and there's going to be uh, several years of continued effort there if we're going to kind of make progress citywide. Um, also, then in the contracted maintenance for streets, uh, there was a small increase there of uh, eighty-five thousand as current year, and we bumped it to eighty-seven. 500. It's a small amount, uh, but my hope is that as we continue to make these small incremental additions to this, that we're creating a more sustainable pot of money to repair roads in the in the long run. Um, on page nine, I just wanted to highlight again, with uh, the department's kind of putting in the effort and trying to find ways to um, to make the ends meet, um, the senior center. Uh, this year their budget was 128,000. Next year is 125,000. So not only did they not increase uh, their budget, they actually cut money from uh, their budget. Um, and in in a small budget, that's incredibly hard to do. So I I just want to point that out because that's um, that's commendable. I think. Um, moving on to page 10, uh, the pavilion expenses is up to 40,000. That's a little bit of carryover of about $5,000. Uh, that's in the bottom group, parks, pavilion expenses. We really want to get one or both of those stairs done, and it's been difficult trying to get it done for the amount of money we had, and it's right on that strange threshold of being public construction or not public construction, and if we can get it done for just under that threshold, we can do it in one method that's probably a little bit cheaper and more streamlined and just go design build. Uh, if it's over, then it becomes public construction, we have to separate the design from the build, and and it just it makes it a little bit more challenging of a, a project and potentially more expensive. So um, we're hoping with the additional money that uh, we can at least see progress on one. Both sides would be the, the ideal there. Uh, next page, um, another commitment that we're continuing is the contract trimming. Um, it looks like it's down. It's down about thirty thousand from this year. That's where. The DNR grant for forestry, uh, that's where those expenses were being lumped in uh, with the ash trees. And if you look back at the uh, 2020 actuals, um, the budget back then was 21000 So we're up $4,000 over uh, the non-grant uh, years. So it is, is an increase over traditional amounts. We still have a ton of ash trees and even just regular trees that have aged and cracked and uh, with the storm we had last night, I think uh, there's plenty of more limbs and branches down, but uh, just wanted to highlight again uh, that Public Works is uh, kind of remaining committed to that uh, expense. Uh, so page 12 is the end of the general fund budget. Um, the only thing I wanted to highlight, and this is kind of the issue, is uh, the 2021 budget number is the total expenses of $4.27 uh, and this year it's 4.43 million, which is um, a difference in budgets of about $158,000. Even though the tax increase is about 32,000, uh, there's 158,000 in uh, higher uh, expenditures. Um, and that's where the expenditure restraint comes in to say you can only uh, go up a amount of inflation and growth 
with growth being very limited this year, more than other years, uh, that's putting a, a crimp on how high that other, the 2020 total uh, general fund expenditures can be uh, before we start to lose that $80,000. So uh, that's the number we have to work on. It's not about bringing more revenue in, it's about mm -hmm. actually dropping revenue and expenditures. Um, and uh, it looks like I'm about 29 cents off um, on this budget, but again, none of it's going to stick. It's all, uh, as we get more information, it'll all come in. And, and cents to four million. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, moving on to the Community Development Authority, uh, the only thing I wanted to point out here was that uh, uh, we're still waiting on some information from uh, Water and Light. We go there on Thursday to talk about uh, their contribution to economic development, uh, but also the uh, the CDA's initiative for property acquisition uh, to establish a fund there. Uh, that is uh, down at the second from the bottom expense line. Uh, so uh, hopefully that uh, we're able to maintain that. That's one of the goals that CDA had uh, to start building that balance. Um, the, the library, um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the library. Um, uh, not that it's not important, uh, but it's, it's preliminary for one thing. And the, the second thing is, the only line that the city council controls with the, uh, the library is the amount of money that we give to them as the, the tax subsidy. Um, and uh, what they've pre presented so far is an increase of $100. Um, again, I think it just goes back to show um, the amount of effort that the department heads are putting in uh, to really be respectful of the limited amount of money we have available. So um, I was very happy to see that um, preliminary. So the library board will be approving that and then submitting that over to us. Um, uh, moving to the aquatic center on page 16. Again, um, you know, looking at the 2021 budget and the 2022 budget, for the second year in a row, the aquatic center has taken a reduced uh, tax subsidy. Uh, dropping about another $900 this year. And so, um, you, you know, in again, a tight budget year, they're finding ways to, to cut further. And it just goes to show uh, the recreation, the senior center, the library, uh, they're all really making a concerted effort to respect uh, the amount of money available. Um, moving forward to, uh, uh, let's see, page 19. Um, I just want to touch on garbage and recycling very quickly. Last year we did a, a change in the garbage rate um, that gave us a budgeted surplus. Again, how they do this historically is they put the, the fees there for a couple years, then they let the uh, contract cost come up to catch them. And then uh, this year, again, we're going to show a very small loss, so I don't think we need to change the rate this year. Next year, likely we'll need to adjust the rate again and next year might be the time to go out and if the council chooses to reevaluate contract terms um, uh, with the, the provider we have. Um, I'm not recommending that at this point, uh, just kind of as a discussion, uh, but we should be good for this year. No change this year, but will be a future issue. Uh, to the cemetery, all I really wanted to point out there was uh, a very small increase. There's a lot of needs in the cemetery and it's uh, as a, a self-sustaining fund it's a very difficult one to run um, uh, there's a, a good cemetery board that's you know they really put in a lot of effort to making it a great cemetery um, and they have a lot of pride in it but the bottom line is there's a ton of expenses out there even just for tree removals um, and it's it's really challenging with the limited revenue um, so i just wanted to point that out that that is an area where there is some need uh, but it's a matter of balancing it with all the other needs we have. Um, so, um, uh, page 24 is the, the municipal court. Um, I, the, the judge has asked if there's any questions about the court budget itself that uh, he'd, he'd love the opportunity to come speak about it. Uh, the one thing I, I just want to point out, there's, there's two lines that um, I pay the most attention to. Uh, one is the tax subsidy line and that went up by $3,000. Um, and then that balances itself out uh, with the third from the bottom, which is due to the city of Columbus. And that's the, um, when they clear out a citation, the amount that gets allocated to the city or municipality where the citation was issued. And that one increased by $21,000. So really there's an $18,000 net 
um, uh, income gain to the city, uh, which is a, a good sign. And the court is uh, not intended to be a cash cow. It's not supposed to be primarily a revenue generator, but it is nice that it is uh, generating the funds that help pay for the law enforcement and other services that uh, that go into feeding the court. So um, keeps the court local and convenient for our citizens. I know that's one of the things that the judge has highlighted to me as a priority. So, um, so this uh, the next one. It's on page thirty one. This is capital projects. I'm probably going to talk just a little bit longer about this one. Um, this one is bigger than it normally is. There's a couple uh, issues here. Uh, that are making it that way. Uh, number one is um, I'm planning for some borrowing here for Highway 89 and some equipment. So uh, in the revenue line at the top, you'll see transfer in from long-term bond funds uh, of 585,500. Uh, we know we have uh, between four and 500,000 in expenses for Highway 89 uh, that will, will hit the, the general fund or non-utility. Uh, there's also some equipment that I think um, uh, we'd like to budget for maybe not this year but in in the coming year and if you're doing the borrowing it makes sense to include it i think all at once um, then the other thing of note is the carryover surplus funds in the capital projects that's a combination of um, the 2017 uh, borrowing that we did there's some remaining funds in there that are, are sort of sitting there as an asset uh, so we'll be clearing those out i will note that's a one-time use when we use them they're done they're not coming back so it's not recurring uh, and James Street also uh, there were some bond funds remaining there and the, the the note funds from 2017 we can use for any public purpose so we're really uh, kind of broadly open there uh, the James Street bond funds have to be uh, committed to um, basically a road project or a street project um, so moving down to the bottom of, of that the street construction that's where the uh, James Street funds are going to help fund is the Highway 89 project uh, because there is a portion of the project that involves removing trees and, and other things in advance of the project um, to make the road project happen. Um, so that's uh, the expenses of 455000 is a combination of um, the tree removal and other project costs associated with the street project, um, non-utility, uh, so not a sewer, but the the street, the parking lane, and then um, also stormwater infrastructure. Um, if you look down at the bottom, there's a surplus of $150,000. That's where I talked about having um, the borrowing accommodate a future um, equipment purchase. That's what that would be is uh, after that surplus uh, goes in there, the following year would have that surplus to pull back in and purchase equipment then. Um, uh, the equipment that we're looking there for $88,000 um, in the uh, the equipment purchases, um, there's a couple things. One is the bucket truck that we've already agreed to to, uh, to buy. This is uh, payment number one. Uh, there's also a 72-inch lawnmower that um, it's been kind of habitually being repaired, and it's one that needed replacement. Um, with the funds on hand, it would be nice to accomplish that if we can. Uh, and then actually it's a, the, the biggest... Uh, ticket item that I have. Uh, th there's a 1994 uh, mini dump that they affectionately call Old Smoky, um, and it's it's used uh, pretty much every day. Um, and so it's one of the more expensive uh, pickup truck style vehicles because it has the box and the dump um, equipment with it, and that's fifty nine thousand uh, dollars. Again, it's a 1994, and it uh, it has served us well. Um, so those are the three, the bucket truck, the lawnmower, and the mini dump replacement are what we're trying to put in this budget um, using a combination of um, existing funds that are remaining in there. Um, there's many more items that um, you know could or maybe even arguably should be replaced, um, but we're trying to you know make priorities in there and try to uh, slowly get the fleet better, get the equipment better, get out of the maintenance and repair and get into the equipment of the age and, and condition it should be. So um, I just, you know, that one is, um, it, it's bigger than we did last year, but I, I think if we can make it happen with the existing funds that are just sitting there, I think it would be a worthwhile investment. Um, moving to page 32 in uh, wastewater, and if you know the funds, fund 600 means we're almost to the end, so there should be some excitement there. Uh, but in on page 32, um, 
not much has changed in the revenue except for uh, there's proceeds from long-term debt. Uh, we do have the Highway 89 project. The utility has to pay for their portion of it. Um, I think we have an uh, opportunity to either combine this as a general obligation borrowing or we could do a revenue bond uh, and separate the utility um, the utility borrowing if we felt like we wanted to preserve more capacity in our general obligation debt. Um, so just to know that's a, a larger item in there. Uh, the street construction is on the next page um, and it just matches it matches that uh, that up. The final thing I'll point out on page 34 is uh, last year we had a, a budgeted surplus of $11,800 on a $1.6 million uh, budget. Uh, this year we're down to 6,500 on a, now it's a 2.4, but again, that's uh, higher because of the road project. Uh, there is a rate study that's been underway since before I started. Um, they've been having issues with the changeover and the finance directors and, and all that. I think they're getting close to getting us a rate study that we can use, um, but we're really getting down to where we're going to be budgeting every year and losing money. Um, so a rate study or a rate increase is likely uh, should be considered in the next year. I believe that's going to be a, a pretty easy guess at what their recommendation is going to be in the study. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, page 35 um, goes into the stormwater fund. This is all conceptual. Um, I sort of picked six months thinking if it got approved in April, uh, get us a couple months to actually get everything lined up. I mean, you'd be You'd have everything lined up, uh, you know, kind of in advance, but the formality of actually sending out the letters and onboarding people and getting them to know on June 1st this starts, I expected maybe six months. Um, really rough round numbers um, there for revenue, uh, trying to guesstimate what, you know, the billing's going to cost. Um, first year is not going to be a great year uh, because there's going to be a lot of things. There's nothing in the, in the pipeline. There's no projects on the shelf. There's nothing been engineered. Uh, you know, there's probably some legal expenses. So there's a lot of getting going there. Uh, and I did not include any debt service in this uh, budget at this time. We can certainly look at that, though, as part of this uh, to say um, if the stormwater utility is approved, then we can borrow this. And so we could put anything we want in the budget. Uh, and then we would just, if it was approved, take the actions to make it happen. Um, so that's, I, I think, one option to consider among a variety of options in the stormwater uh, arena. Um, I used a couple things, you know, I matched some of the, um, the administration levels from some of the TIF funds uh, to find some of the, um, the allocated costs for salaries. And then I took the stormwater um, salaries that are in the general fund and move them over here as well to kind of match the level of effort. Um, so that's kind of where some of those numbers come from. Uh, but it's really a blank canvas now. So if there's a desire as we move forward to have it look different or prioritize it in a different way, you know, all options are really on the table at this point. Um, uh, I'll also say that none of these salary numbers or any of these expenses mean anything outside of this fund. Uh, this is completely uh, in a draft. So if we cut this and don't do this, it doesn't impact any other funds because those are actual funds that actually exist and actually have expenses allocated. Uh, this is uh, potentially something we'll do, but not enough to take money out of the general fund or other funds to um, allocate here. Um, and then there's just the remaining the ARPA and the May Ward Fund. ARPA uh, is a, another blank canvas. And I think that's something that uh, CDA and the City Council uh, will be kind of addressing in the coming months as we look forward to, you know, what, um, what those funds could be used for. So uh, sorry to make it take uh, relatively long there, but I, I did just want to hit those high points, kind of walk through a little bit of it. And then um, I don't know if anyone has any questions right now. Uh, Paul Lurie got a question. Um. I, I, and I can appreciate this being a draft, and I'm not a, a numbers person by any means, but I just I would just ask, what's, what would be one or two items that are not in this budget that, that were asked for and that we cannot do? And maybe that's a hard question to ask, but... 
Uh, I mean, there's there's another lawnmower uh, that's in there. Uh, there's other pickup trucks that are in there. Uh, there's additional tree trimming money. There's additional sidewalk money. Uh, there's money that should be put towards the roads. Uh, I mean, uh, 10, 20, 30, 40,000 could easily go that direction. Uh, park buildings, uh, the pavilion. Uh, I, I mean, there's just... Uh, there's just a, a whole variety of things and um, you know I, I think Jerry's been doing a really good job of noting all of these things and I, he's got a really good perspective on it too to say you know none of this happened in the last year or two but here we are and so what we're trying to do is is find ways to increase um, our ability to address some of these and it's going to take time um, uh, you know we can try to borrow our way out of it but then you're saddled with debt and then uh, you know you're you're paying you know 10 or 20 years on something that uh, you know really might not even last that long so um, I, I will at uh, at a future meeting have a list of uh, kind of anything I cut from the budget there's very little that was asked for that wasn't included here uh, the one I think that comes to mind is uh, stormwater culvert repair I think they were asking to carry it over and then add it on to make it you know not ten thousand dollars like it was this year to make make it 20 um, and then uh, just with uh, the carryover we had, it, I couldn't do it. Um, but there is a whole variety, and that's that's at every level. I mean, that's at the senior center. It's at City Hall. Uh, our roof is going to need a full replacement or a major renovation here in the coming years. I think we've committed to just patching it um, for the next several years until we get some breathing room. Um, fire department, police department, senior center, recreation. Uh, it's just all across the board. And then Public Works has the greatest exposure to all buildings and all the infrastructure in the city, probably. And uh, they just have, you know, an immense amount of needs and some wants of things that would make the, the community better or make it a better workplace or more efficient. Um, but we're not even in the, the ballpark of being able to fund something like that. And it's, so it's a long road that we have to kind of walk. Uh, there is some uh, some light at the end of the tunnel, so I don't want it to make it seem like this is a downward spiral. Um, you know, when TID 3 closes, I think that's going to give us some breathing room. Uh, there are some incentive payments in the general fund that will be coming off here in the next couple of years. That will have a substantial impact. Um, and then I think as we do see some of this uh, residential growth uh, take off or be enabled by some land availability, um, that will have a, a very changing effect on the budget and the amount of growth that we have and the amount of um, other things that we can you know add to the budget that maybe are you know infrastructure but also things that improve quality of life um, like our parks like our pool um, you know one of the things um, not to get too boring here this late at night but you know one of the things that I noted during the candidate forums was that almost everyone talked about how great the amenities for a city our size were and how that made it a great place to live and it really attracted people to the community and so I think those all come with a cost uh, and we do have to balance that but I don't think we want to lose sight of the fact that that is something that makes us special and makes the quality of life good here so it's always a balancing act um, so thank you did we ever get this in electronic form so we can look at it more clearly yes yep I can get it to you thank you anybody else I like paper <laughs> <laughs> well I bet anybody else have any questions or comments I like shirt and paper too <laughs> Um, I, I think your idea of, uh, for those of us who feel like we need an in-service on, uh, you know, Shelly and I have talked about this uh, on how the whole budgeting process works. I'd be interested in that. I mean, those of you with a whole lot more experience probably don't feel like you need it, but um, me, or maybe with an accounting background. <laughs> but, but I'd be interested in that, and should we just, like, get a hold of you, maybe... So I think it depends, and this is a good time to decide it, uh, you know, if we want to set up a group session. Um, the issue there is that the questions that Sarah might have might not be the questions that, that um, uh, Shelly has. Sorry, I can't see your nameplate. And then I was thinking Pete and Paul. And <laughs> lost my train of thought for a minute. Uh, I mean, so that's the risk is that we're going to, everyone's got to go through things that they might not have questions on, which could or could not be beneficial. Um, so I'm willing to meet one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, willing to try to explain it on email uh, or just sit down. Um, 
but if the council wants to set up a uh, like a, a meeting or work session um, I'm open to that as well and we can cover a lot of information yep I you know I guess I'm just aware of how much time Kyle's putting in now working on the budget so I and I feel a little protective so I want to make sure that you're not you know what I mean yeah. so anyway but yeah I mean I, I think it's it's I look at it from the reverse angle in that uh, some people find the group setting great. Other people are like, no, I've got 17 questions. I just want my 17 questions. Okay. And it might be, work better to come during the day. It might work better just over the phone. So I'm flexible. But if the group does want to set something, now is the best time to set something that works for the most people. So I Go prefer ahead, the group setting. That's just, just what I, that's, I, I makes think, more sense to me. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I know Shelly and I have talked about it, and I'd like to get together, I think, with someone else because, honestly, there are times when I feel like I don't know enough to know what questions to ask. But right, and people can feed off of each other. You right. know, if Sarah asks a question and then, like, oh, yeah, that reminds me type thing. You don't know what you don't know. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. exactly. So yeah. it sounds like everybody would prefer a group session is... So I suppose the next thing is um, you have to decide when that's going to be. Budget season is not super long, so um, like it could be an alternate Tuesday evening. It could be a yeah. weekend brunch. It could be what do people <laughs> think works best? Gina? Oh, no, and again, I'm used to the, the olden time <laughs> where it might be easily an extra 20 hours um, outside of the normal council sessions um, for hammering out budgets. So, I mean, this is just shock and awe seeing anything this concise. Right, at, it's at already this point. like put to, even though it's a draft, it's put together. And we haven't sat it's here shocking. for 27 hours before we've gotten to this point. So yes, that's awesome. Yes, literally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but good to know. <laughs> anybody, any input on when? you would like to do some sort of group thing or do you want to think about it and come up with some options I could send out a doodle poll if are we looking for weeknights or weekends or is it just all sorts of options I, I uh, in the previous community uh, they had a, a real desire to have it Saturday mornings with coffee donuts and juice and spend nine to noon and then you're done but I am out of town quite a bit in October and I'm gone the 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th, and the 14th, 15th, 16th, and 17th. So probably for me, a weeknight or a weekend other than those. I'm sorry, both of those trips are work, so I can't change them. I was thinking like maybe a Tuesday when we don't have a council yeah. meeting. Yeah. Um, and I... I are any of those Tuesdays the nights you're going to be gone or because no I, no those are all Thursday Friday Saturday Sunday okay what, what do you think Shelly that works for me okay I mean if we Tuesday? could do it a little bit earlier instead of 6 30 maybe oh yeah do it sure. you know do maybe 5 30 or yeah okay so a doodle poll most likely alternate Tuesdays and perhaps some um times that are not 6.30, perhaps earlier times, sounds like the goal. Um, just to remind everybody, we are still in a meeting and you do still have microphones. Our media coordinator is trying to keep up with everyone not using oh. them, but <laughs> is, so just remember to turn it on and wait to be called on. Uh, anybody else, any ideas? How quickly? What's that? <laughs> How quickly do we want to meet? I mean. Uh, so in two weeks, I'll be bringing kind of my final draft, and then it, it sort of in the process, uh, it's, it probably oversells it, but you know that's really me handing this to you as the council, and then it, it, it becomes yours, and you either you know adopt it and make it your own, or make changes to make it more your own. Um, so I I would not suggest we meet in a week because I won't have a lot of numbers between now and next Tuesday. Uh, maybe the week following that when we should have more numbers i would also point out we are going to have two new council people That's soon what I was going so to. it would make the most sense to wait until mm -hmm. after october 19th when they will be present october 26th maybe would be an option 
we'll put out some options, I think, yeah. and, and just kind of. Okay. So, Carl, what is your goal as far as having the budget completed? Hey, Shelly, microphone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> what is your goal? Uh, so October 5th is when I, uh, so basically in two weeks, I owe you my proposed budget, which is okay. going to be a lot like this. Um, we'll, we'll know some more numbers, but there'll be still some numbers that we just have to put a, a budget number in and uh, and hope that it, it does accommodate it. Um, then um, on October 19th, that's when uh, the, the mayor and city council consider the proposed budget, uh, suggest and incorporate any changes, um, and then you can approve it for publishing. Now, that sounds very final and like, oh, well, so we're approving it on October 19th, but the reality is, uh, while you wouldn't want to make wild changes to it, um, really you can make changes to that budget anytime right up to adoption. But we want to publish something that fairly reflects what we think the budget is going to look like in, in totality. Um, and then we would be actually approving it somewhere um, November 16th or November 23rd would be sort of the, the backup date. Um, we like to keep it early because that all plays into tax roll and tax bills and, and all that. So the, the further we go into November, it makes it really challenging to get tax bills out and the tax roll completed. So, Yeah, 26th right. looks, looks good. I mean, at least in my, on my calendar. Okay. So I think Kyle is a good, good direction for some potential dates and times for doodle pull. Awesome. If there's nothing else, I would take a motion to move into closed session. Oh, goodness, I don't have my thing to read all the... Can I steal yours, Mary? Is that the right one? Uh, nope. Yeah. Sorry. I was missing... Oh, thank you. I got it now. <laughs> um, I'll take a motion to convene to closed session per 19.851C to consider employment promotion compensation or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility and discuss the compensation of select employees. Thank you. I will make a motion to convene to closed session. Alder Motive will second. I have a motion and a second. Pat, could you take a roll? Um, Arnold? Here. Yes. <coughs> Gray? <laughs> Aye. Motive? Aye. Piperone? Aye. Reed? Aye. Albright? Aye. Motion carried. Perfect. We are now in closed session. <laughs>